Hey friends, excited to be here with you today and do a an episode on the location of the real Mount Sinai. Now, those of you who have uh, been aware of this ministry for some time, you know I've actually traveled there. Uh, I went with Andrew Jones and his group uh, a couple of years ago, and we did a whole tour of uh, of the mountain in Saudi Arabia, northwest Saudi Arabia, what, which we think is the uh, the real location of the real Mount Sinai. If you do your homework on it and you look at the traditional Mount Sinai, it doesn't really seem to fit the bill. So that's why uh, not only did I come to the conclusion that Mount Sinai is actually in Northwest Saudi Arabia, but uh, I actually traveled there with my son. Like I said, I traveled there with Andrew Jones, who just happens to be our guest today. And uh, he's gonna lay out the case and respond to some recent criticism about this site. You know, there's always haters out there, people who disagree with what you think. Very interesting how there seems to be a lot of public opinion going in this direction the last several years. It was popularized by a man named Ron Wyatt. It's been a while since I've actually done a, th this particular topic in my content. And so uh, if it's something you're not aware of, I'm really excited for you to learn about it today. And without any further ado, I'm going to introduce Andrew to you right now. So. Here is Andrew. Andrew, how you doing, my brother? Hey, how you doing, Pastor? Thanks for having good, me. Good, man. Good and good to have you on again. I don't. Was my intro okay? Yeah, like, did I, awesome. Yeah. Did I nail I, it? I mean, I had great <laughs> memories of that trip with you and your son. We, you know, going across Egypt. You know, we had our own drama. We had our own uh, fun times and memories. We did. We had we the whole spectrum. We were like just like the Israelites. You yes. know, with the, their their adventure was full of drama. It must be the region. It must I be the region. So. We went, yeah, we started in Egypt. I mean, and, I mean, if you're listening yeah. to this or watching this right now, you can actually, you could join Andrew does tours. He takes people, um, starts them in Egypt. You can go to the pyramids, see all that cool stuff. Uh, you go to the traditional Sinai, which is in the Sinai Peninsula. Go to Sinai in Saudi Arabia. And then he takes you all the way through to, uh, to Israel. Uh, yeah, to we see, follow the route you know, of the, the Exodus Sa it's, from, yeah, yeah, all the way to the Promised Land. Yeah, yeah, so we kind of, maybe that's why the drama came up, because we took the route of the Exodus. We did what the Israelites did. But uh, a lot of fun, though. I mean, really, honestly, an amazing great. trip. Uh, really, just so much fun. In fact, maybe, I don't have them queued up here, but maybe if you see, if I'm showing photos right now, um, it's because I spliced them in after the fact, uh, you know, of, of our trip. Just, yeah, we had a great time. Uh, and I, I still have connections with with uh, many of the people that we uh, got yeah. to know. I know same, on Facebook same. and Instagram yeah. and other stuff. So just, just a great time. But um, can you give us the skinny real quick on uh, just this location? Like, and yeah. um, uh, before you start your presentation and everything like that, did I frame everything correctly? I mean, this is basically, we think this is Mount Sinai and right. Um, right. I mean, we're not nuts. It's, yeah. I mean, there's at least a dozen or so proposed Mount Sinai's. And again, this is not a salvational issue. Like if you don't believe it's this peak, you're going to hell. <laughs> <laughs> so, but some people seem to think that if you believe it's in Arabia, that you're totally yeah, crazy. Yeah. And, and I, I don't think that that's the case. And I really do believe that this site has great geographical um, evidence, historical evidence. It makes logical sense. Even if you look at some of the archaeology for the land of Midian, that this is where Mount Sinai has to be. So that's why I'm so excited to show people these sites in person or on my YouTube channel, because I believe um, it does make a great case for the, these events being real when you actually Yeah, give us your YouTube that, channel real quick and then also your website. So in case somebody wants to book a tour. I, uh, if they want to see these videos, and I'll put yours up later, uh, Discovered Media. That's my YouTube uh, username. You can look up Discovered Media. And we have stuff about our work here in Turkey, where I'm at right now. And also in Egypt, Saudi Arabia, and Jordan, and, and we sometimes go to, into Israel too. Um, but I, my big topics of research I love is Noah's Ark and the Exodus of Mount Sinai. So um, I've been going back and forth between Saudi Arabia since 2016, even before they uh, you know opened up for tourism. But now you can go on a tourist visa. It's very simple. And yes, we do have tours there. You go to DiscoveredSinai.com. <laughs> that's the website, DiscoveredSinai.com. Uh, and, uh, and our YouTube discovered channel, like so past tense, like discovered exactly. with a, yeah. an ED on the end, discovered Sinai.com. Discovered Sinai.com. And then you go to the tour um, menu. Uh, it's also linked in all, most of all our videos and the YouTube descriptions. Um, and you can uh, check out um, our dates. We have dates mainly in the winter months and in the late um, fall and early spring because of the, how hot it gets in the summer. 
So in the summer times we're in Turkey, and the winter months we're down in Egypt and Saudi Arabia. Okay, uh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, and that that was the one part we didn't see was the whole Noah's Ark thing. And uh, you yeah, know that, we just uh, finished our last tour this season. We went to we do now the whole patriarch tour. We start from the mountains of Ararat, where I'm at here in eastern Turkey. And we go all the way down to phenomenal. Iran, Jacob's Well in Haran, and Abraham's sites, and Job. So, yeah. Yeah, maybe one day. It's on my to-do list, my friend, to do that. Uh, the <laughs> yeah, first, Turkey has so much The front history. half of the tour. And, uh, and I would highly recommend, I mean, if somebody's considering this, like you do church groups, like you could take, uh, I've yeah, told a couple private, of pastor uh, friends of mine already, we, like yeah, you could do a church do, group. Uh, private. Church groups. And it's so we much better when you go through with you because you're going, you know, right where these locations are. You know how to get in. You've done it multiple times. Like, it, th- you don't want to really do something like this on your own because of, because of where some of these places are. I mean, it would be hard to find them. It's uh, yeah, I it mean, just th- was... there are obviously adventure travelers out there who, who hate tour groups. But um, for those who really want to see it the first time, you can come back on your own. Um, or even if you just showed up, if I'm here, in, for example, because I'm living here in Turkey in the summer. If you just show up at the site and you send me an email, if I'm around, I'll go explain what, why we believe it's Noah's Ark, you know, for free. <laughs> so you don't have, you don't have to go, do on a, go on a tour. And so Saudi Arabia, because uh, I'm usually going in and out of the country, that's usually more planned out. Uh, but, yeah, uh, we, we help people get to the sites on their own. It's not just a money thing. Um, yeah, and yeah. we also, if you want to help support us in our research, you can go on our tours. Uh, but uh, definitely some of these sites are hard to get to or you got to be careful how you're driving through the sand or where you're going. Uh, no, more and more, Saudi's opening up and they're paving the roads. I don't know if you know this, but they've uh, paved the road to the Split Rock. Holy so, cow. Know, I know that when we were there two years ago, they had all the markers up, and I think they were yeah. – I think they told Marking you they the were going to pave it, but that's that's something. Yeah. I, has they there been any the uh, defacement ago. on it? What's that? They just finished the road a month or two ago, a friend of mine. Oh, just, okay. Do, have they – I know there was concerns too that some of these, you know, with them paving it, more people seeing it, that they're – you know, maybe some of these these uh, locations would get, you know, vandalism or they might get destroyed. Maybe they, there's no respect for them or that kind of thing. I'm assuming you everything's been okay. They, they did clean up – I don't know if it was during your tour or after – but did you see when they had like – someone had spray painted their name and the date like on the rocks about by the split rock? Yes, all white. yes, yeah. That's all been cleaned up. So they have actually okay. cleaned it up. And they okay. had some type of – we met the people cleaning it up and they regularly pick up the trash there now. Uh, they, okay. they did tell us they want to you know, install like public restrooms there. Uh, so I, they realized the public pot- – uh, the, the uh, tourism potential. Um of course, that does mean, you know, with the paved road, anybody in their car can get out there, a bicycle. But, uh, you know, <laughs> I, I do miss the good old days. And for me, I was, this was even after the Caldwells and Ron Wyatt were out there sneaking around. But in, even 2016, you know, it, just, it felt like you're out there with the Israelites, you know. Oh, even, yeah. I mean, well, absolutely. Yeah, was, that, that's the one thing know, I was going to say you missed with the paved roads. Yeah. So, yeah. You know, and I, mean, I, I road remember, road. you know, driving through the desert with you, you know, in, in a caravan yeah. of uh, – you That's know, right. SUVs. You were one of the drivers. <laughs> yeah, I, well, yeah. Yeah, I think I hit something too, and I had to pay fifteen hundred dollars before they let me leave the country. Oh, man, yeah, I forgot. The I, very last I came down minute. on a rock, a big rock on the side of the car. You the, know, the sideboard or something. Yeah, right? yeah, 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 yeah. They they wouldn't let us leave either, man. That was uh, oh, yeah. that was one of the adventurous parts. Yeah. <laughs> surprise, surprise. Yeah, <laughs> but uh, yeah, and, and I think this is like an important thing because. Uh, there's been a, a lot of people don't realize that <clears throat> there's been a lot of skepticism about like biblical evidence uh, historically. Yeah. And there's a reason for that. Um, I would say in particular with Mount Sinai, like people in modern skeptics saying, Oh, the Exodus never happened. I would say one of the reasons for that is because of the traditional location of Mount Sinai, because it's in the wrong location. It can't really hold the amount of Israelites that, you know, you would think it could hold. And I, I know you're going to go over some of this with us now, but my, my point here is that like, it, this is important because it gives us evidence for these stories in the Bible uh, against modern scholarship that's saying, you know, this, these, these things never happened. And like, you're going to show us in a minute here, like, like yeah, we'll there's a lot of evidence. Of these, the criticism, um, especially leveled at this <clears throat> site. And I think it, it's, there's two things in, being involved here. Number one, just the, you know, we're talking about this event where they had the sea split in two. So you're going to get a lot of critics. You know, obviously, people today who were not there are saying, how, how is that possible? And the yeah. 10 plagues of Egypt, you know. With and God, all things of, are you know, Bread coming from the sky and, and fire coming down in the mountain. Yeah. Uh, the voice of God speaking to people, you know. 
uh, they just sound too supernatural. So you'll have that yeah. level of criticism. Then you also have those who say, well, you know, we just don't know where these things are anymore. So when you try to like pinpoint a site and say, hey, this is where this event happened in the Bible, then yes, you, you need to defend it because people want to see the evidence. And then you'll have critics who'll say, no, you know, I disagree. And um, so, you know, today uh, it's mainly about those who, who um, this one individual in particular who, who came out with a video a month or two ago. Um, and he's had previous videos before that kind of attacking that Sinai is in Arabia, the route of the Exodus going through Nueva, that whole thing he's uh, attacked. And so he, he, his last video on the topic, he had a 16 point uh, attack against the site. And so I, and that's why I contacted you and said, hey, we should uh, rebut this and um, you know, do our best <laughs> to explain why we believe that. Sinai yeah, I, is I think Arabia. it's great, you know, because you do have people who they will. Uh, it sounds like my neighbor just fired up his lawnmower out there. So I apologize if you're, <laughs> if you're listening to this, <laughs> it probably won't be too bad, but, uh, it, he's got a zero turn. So hopefully, hopefully it'll go away here in a couple of minutes. But, um, uh, but I think it's important, like you have these people that, are, that they're just not going to believe no matter what, you know, there's, yeah. you know, people who just, they're not going to believe they, the, the, all these biblical stories are just too fantastical for them. Fire coming down from heaven, the sea splitting. Um, the, I think the sad thing is that if you look at the location you're going to tell us about that, it does actually show us um, like that this could have happened somewhere. You know, at least we have a place where yeah. these stories came from and we yeah. lose that sort of bite from the atheists that like these, they're just fictional and made up, you know, that the, there was actually a place and a time where this happened. So that's just a credibility thing, like f on the atheist side, but from the believer perspective, you know, or the perspective of us, of people who are believers in Jesus and in these stories, like this this stuff is so encouraging. When you see the real places, when you see the top of this mountain that's black, and you see the the split rock, and you go, "This has got to be the split rock that Moses struck." And you see the the Red Sea. It's the only place where the Red Sea could have been parted. You know, it really it adds like a whole. It, it takes your faith to another level. So I I think that's why it's important. I just wanted to say that before you started, yeah. and then why don't you take yeah, us? Yeah, we're not uh, trying to take us on your take journey. Away. Yeah, and we're not trying to take away faith in the Word of God by trying to find the physical proof. Yeah, but because yeah, yeah. you know, in archaeology, it's dealing with cultural remains or geo geography. If the Bible says this event happened in front of a mountain and you had so many people, then you need to find a mountain in the Middle East that could fit that description. And when you do, you're going to get excited because that's probably then the place that the event happened. And that you know, the Exodus is a very important event throughout the whole Bible. Uh, the writers talked about it and referred back to Moses. No, he was their greatest prophet, uh, to the Exodus and Red Sea crossing. You know, this is in the foundation of Israel as a nation uh, after they made a covenant with God at Sinai. Uh, so uh, it's a very important story, and it's not just, uh, you know, Bronze Age myth. It's actually a real uh, uh, event that happened. Yeah, amen, my friend. So tell us, uh, give us a little bit of the background. Yeah. I'm going to give the screen to you. Give us a little bit of the background. Tell okay. us about... Uh, Dr. Falk, well, and uh, why yeah, this is actually Mount Sinai. Yeah, so we'll get through, as we go through these, there's 16 points. So as we go through, hopefully it makes sense. Now, usually in a rebuttal video, you are you listen to part of what the guy says, and then you rebut it, so you go back and forth. So if you haven't watched this video, um, and when I put this video up, I'll link to it, and I, I'm sure Pastor AJ will give a link out if you want to watch Dr. Falk's uh, video uh, otherwise, it's kind of hard to because I'm actually absolutely. Yeah, to I'll, there, I'll put a link in the description rebuttal. to it. <clears throat> okay, good. Yeah, because you know I'm going through these points, and these are points that he was making in his rebuttal. Um, but you know, there other people have said the same thing. But uh, he did a, a really good job in 20 minutes. You know, going through really th fast, uh, attacking the site. And I thought, well, um, I, I think there's some points that could be made uh, countering what he said, so that there's no, there's no confusion or someone's looking up some information, they'll see that someone did respond to Dr. Falk. And now I'm not an Egyptologist like he is. Uh, I believe he's from Canada, um, or that's where he lives now. Uh, but at any rate, I subscribe to his channel. I watch his videos. I find them interesting. Uh, I don't always have to agree with everything he says. Uh, you know, he, he believes in a, a late Exodus, uh, 19th dynasty, Ramses II, I believe is his pharaoh. Uh, so, uh, there, are, there are points, and it doesn't matter <laughs> whether he, he uh, like whether I agree with him or not on that. Uh, but I do. But, but one of the reasons it. that's important is because that that's another reason people don't believe that there's evidence for the Exodus because they take that early date, right? 
The, the, you mean the late date? Yeah. The late date, the, rather. Yeah. The, yeah, they say it yeah. happened in the 12th century. <clears throat> right, yeah. The 14th yeah, yeah. or the 15th century. <clears throat> yeah, so, um, but, you know, you do have great Christian scholars um, uh, who believe in a late date, um, the, not the early Exodus. Uh, and it's, wrong. it's a top. Yep. There's no. <laughs> yeah, they're wrong. Exactly. Um, you know, no, I, I have friends who are um, a certain denomination. I'll just say you're wrong at that point. But we're great Christian <laughs> brothers. <laughs> but and, but and lovingly, gently, and can and, tell them they're wrong. That's all. Yeah, exactly. And with archaeology, you know, some of these points, you know, like none of us was there. We don't know if the Israelites took this wadi or that wadi. Yeah. But it does come out to me more than just, okay, do they really walk down this valley or this one? But more, uh, is this really the mount, <laughs> mountain of God? Is this the mountain of Moses? Um, and so he is taking the view that everything um, – he's very anti Ron Wyatt, which is uh, fine for itself. But uh, when you look at the actual data or the points he's making, I think there's, uh, you know, there's more to it than what he said. So uh, that's why I'm wanting to do this for a while. This is not a – uh, a pro Ron White video because there's some things I don't agree with, um, and none of us was there, so we're, we're doing our best to figure things out still. And uh, but uh, the first point he made in his video um, was that uh, the route of the Exodus. Now, so if you look at his channel, Doctor Falk believes that the Red Sea crossing happened at the one of the marshy lakes right along, right near the Mediterranean Sea. Uh, along that eastern border, which you can say today is the Suez Canal, kind of cuts right through that area. And so there's different points along that canal where different scholars t in the modern times have tried to put the Exodus. Now, him and um, some other scholars, like uh, uh, I think he even agrees with Roll on this point, uh, for the Exodus route and um, others, um, like uh, Hoffmeyer, um, these are you know Christians, especially Hoffmeyer, I mean, who believe that the Exodus all happened been near Egypt. And Tim Mahoney's Patterns of Evidence does a great job uh, showing that debate. So we're not trying to cover all that in a couple of minutes here with this one point. But what he does say in this, and I wanted to bring this out, is in his little 20-minute uh, video, um, he talks about how uh, those who say Nueva is the crossing, that we try to use uh, uh, Exodus chapter 14, um, verse 3, I think it is, where it talks, and I don't have it on the screen here, but it's where Moses says that uh, the Israelites will be lost in the wilderness. Uh, well, God tells Moses this. He says that turn back, go to basically the Red Sea crossing. And when you do that, Pharaoh will think you're lost in the wilderness, hemmed in. And so Dr. Falk says, ah, we're reading into the text because we're trying to say that the Red Sea crossing has to have mountains. And that's how they're hemmed in. And he said, no, 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 the original Hebrew word says it's the wilderness, uh, and the wilderness <laughs> means uh, desert only, you know. And it talks about thinking, thought, well, let's see if that's true. And it, all you have to do is a Bible search. I have Lagos, a Bible software. You can look up the Hebrew word. You can find other verses that use it. And here is a verse that used that same Hebrew word um, in Exodus chapter 19, 2, and there are others. And it talks about, in fact, I think he even uses this verse later on in one of his points, but it talks about the Israelites arriving at Mount Sinai, and it uses the word wilderness, and it says that they encamp before the mountain. So Dr. Hull, Dr. Falk's whole idea um, that you can't say Nueva had mountains because wilderness doesn't is not a mountainous area. Well, here it's using wilderness for the area around Mount Sinai, which yeah. even his site, which is the traditional site, which I, Pastor AJ, you saw too. We went to the traditional. Remember the hotel there? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, that was an awesome experience. <laughs> we had a little switcheroo at the hotel. Come on, like yours. Yeah. <laughs> we tried two hotels out. <laughs> we just <laughs> jumped. <laughs> But you could Anyways, never, at, at the traditional site, in my opinion, I, and this is something yeah. that I had to talk to David Roll about previously, um, you can't, I don't, I can't see large groups of people there. The large volume, of, yeah. this is the big problem. You well, just can't see. that's where they see. shrink it down. Yeah. Yeah. They so try you to have say, to, and well, I know Roll not, and others probably take like a yeah. smaller, they think the, it was a, the Israelites were a yeah. smaller number. The big problem with that is that you, you don't have enough people to populate the promised land. I mean, this was like a giant, like yeah. migration of people. Yeah. You know, that they, they took over an entire region of the world. You know, it's a, a small region, yeah. but a region of the world. How are these people, you know, if there was only 10,000 people or 20,000 people, like how are they, you know, That's taking what they over? Say. They yeah. Say it yeah. Between, so. In fact, uh, that's another point he makes later is about the population difference. Like we're saying, well, the, you know, the book of Exodus says 600,000 men. 
And they're trying to say, well, that means groups of people. So we're looking at 10,000 to 100,000 at most. That's what uh, Dr. Falk says. Um, and so you know, if you look at the campsite uh, um, and, and this idea that the, the wilderness has to only be mountains, well, actually, when you, when you uh, I'm sorry, it has to be not mountains. But when you look at that word, it, it basically means anywhere where the, there is no cultivation, no, no one's living. Uh, like today in America, we have wilderness national – like national parks. We have set aside wilderness areas, especially in the West Coast. And when you go to those wilderness areas, guess what? Some of them are grassy areas. Others have our valleys. Yeah. A lot of I, them are I mean that's how I would take mountains. the word. Yeah. Yeah. Wilderness doesn't mean no like desert. Right. And it can apply to a desert if there's no one living there. And, and most people don't live in a desert. So, you know, exactly. Um, but it also can apply to a mountainous area. Just like this verse here is using that term for Mount Sinai, saying that around Mount Sinai was a wilderness that the Israelites encamped in. Well, his Mount Sinai is St. Captain's. Um, monastery area, and that is full of mountains. There's a little valley in the front, a little plain, and it's just cover, uh, but surrounded and covered by mountains. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. So, I, so this would be a if you if you take his reasons for uh, attacking the Weba, saying, well, there's no mountains mentioned in you know Exodus chapter 14. <clears throat> well, you can say the exact same logic. Yeah, he's kind of contradicting to, himself. Yeah. So the 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 term uh, wilderness can be any of these areas. Um, now, if you look at uh, Wadi Watir and this, like how when the Bible writers, like this is Moses obviously, talking about the Exodus route, they're going into an area that no one's been before. You know, today we're marking on, here's Google Earth, I'm marking that down this valley. But back then, you're walking in an area that probably even Moses never even went down. So when God told Moses, hey, turn down and change your direction of travel, go into this area where Pharaoh will think, wow, you're totally lost. Uh, you're hemmed in by mountains, uh, or it doesn't say that, but hemmed in by the wilderness, you know, this the deserted area. Um, and so if you look at where Wadi Wichir goes, and this is why people think Nueva is the crossing site. You know, start with Ron Wyatt looking for a big beach. He flew an airplane back in the late 70s. He rented one from it a lot, and they flew down to Nueva. And he's taking pictures along this Gulf of Aqaba. And he sees that Nueva sticks out like a sore thumb, and it's the biggest beach in the area. And if you look at a, then a, a hydraulical map of the region, this is the biggest drainage where water is coming down. So you have all these side canyons. And if you don't know where you're going, you can easily get lost in there. And, and basically, you're just wandering around in a circle. And I kind of if, I don't know if you can see it, but it's marked on this map. All these call it, um, side uh, valleys uh, coming down into Wadi Watir, the big valley that runs to Nueva, where you're blocked in by mountains. So even though uh, Exodus uh, chapter 14 doesn't say mountains, uh, this gives the same idea of a wilderness area that no one's living and that they're basically lost in there if they were to turn down this way. And so it fits the Bible that way. Now, if you look at his Red Sea crossing site and other scholars who accept this close site to Egypt, this is the land of Goshen right here, this green area, the eastern Nile Delta. And then here's the Suez Canal, this blue line going all the way down uh, from the Mediterranean down to the Gulf of Aqaba. And is on this uh, this eastern side, which is basically the the border with the, um, Egypt back then. Uh, they they're looking for the Red Sea crossing, but I, I when I, I've driven through a lot of this area, and I don't understand how you can say that the Israelites were lost in this land. Yeah, that sounds ridiculous to me. By any, yeah, you're going through it, farmland most of the time. <laughs> you're very close to Goshen. Um, why would Pharaoh think you're um, escaping Egypt? When you're, um, you know, you're there and still in Egypt. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, for me, that verse doesn't even apply to their location. Um, and in fact, the Israelites, uh, just you get know, on a side point here. You no, know, when the Israelites were at the Red Sea crossing, wherever you want to put it, they knew they were outside of Egypt. Here, even in, in ancient yeah, that's times, like that's, that is side, Egypt. You know? Yeah, even on, in ancient times, when you're walking through there on the way of Horus, you're on the uh, western side of of the you know the the canals and walls they had back then, the fortresses. So on that western side, in the in this lush land of Goshen, you're still in Egypt. Yeah. Yet when they're at the Red Sea crossing, what do they complain to Moses? They said, "You brought us out of Egypt to die in the wilderness." Right, right, right. So and they kept saying that over and over. You brought us out of Egypt. 
Well, and you wouldn't consider yourself out of Egypt there. This was not foreign land. And it's not safe. Uh, it's, and, it just makes no sense at all with the Bible story. Like if God's trying to, to bring his people into a safety, away from yeah. Pharaoh's army, away from the Egyptians, like, it, like if you just look at what, that, what we call the Red Sea today, which that, it was Yom Su for them. But if you look at the Red Sea, the location you talked about in Nueva, that location you pointed out is the only place that a large that anybody could cross if hypothetically you know you believe in miracles and the in the in the water was part of that's the only place that a group of people could could cross anywhere in that entire yeah. arm of the red sea that is the only place and like yeah, and you th- and you brought it up actually that was his next attack against okay oh okay okay side, i mean arabia sorry to jump yeah, the next thing was that <laughs> so, no 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 i was, was excited great, great lead in because <laughs> <laughs> you know, he was – his attack – you know, because people say, well, you know, if you look at the Gulf of Aqaba, Nueva is the only place, you know, one or two million plus people could fit. Uh, and so his next attack is, well, you don't need one or two million people uh, on the exodus. It was like yeah, minimum 10,000 <laughs> – and yeah, at most 100,000, which I disagree with. But even if you had 100,000 people, um, it's still not you enough. still need – yeah, number one, you still need a beach that's near, uh, that's big enough to fit both them and the Egyptian army. Yeah. Plus, you can't have a Red Sea crossing where if you remove this water, and I'm getting ahead of myself because there's another point I want to make about the underground topography, the bathymetric map, because he claims that, oh, well, you know, this is the worst location ever. And he kind of has a smirk and laughs when people bring, you know, when he's bringing this up because he thinks it's just so silly, this idea that this is the Red Sea crossing. But if you look at it, <laughs> there's only one way on to Nueva's beach. The other locations doesn't fit. Uh, this one way <clears throat> on to Nueva, it comes off the ancient trade route between Egypt and uh, Midian here in Saudi Arabia, yeah. that route that goes across the central peninsula. And this is what Moses fled al- along 40 years before. When he fled Pharaoh, he went along that route. And so, and then God's telling him, bring the, you know, the, the Israelites back to this mountain. So Moses, okay, I'll just, you know, he's following the cloud, but they're this mass of people, whether it's a hundred thousand or one or two million people, they're following the cloud along this trade route until God tells them to change the direction and get basically lost in the mountains. At least Pharaoh thinks they're lost um, in this wilderness area. And this is the only spot where you can get lost like that off the main route. Like it's like training off the main highway, taking a side road into some countryside you don't know where you're at and it's a dead end road that's what the israelites did but it, it, the beach cannot just be a large enough beach for the israelites you also got to have the water removed and once the water is removed you got to have a, a path for them to, to walk down yeah and this is the only spot along the whole gulf of Aqaba. if you're going to look at the gulf as being the red sea crossing then this is the only spot that matches that yeah. um and i have a, a graphic well, it's, it's coming up because so he 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 covers a lot of points and we're kind of combining stuff in one uh, thing here. But at uh, any rate, um, his big point about Nueva this 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 slide was well, you don't need to have a big beach. Uh, so I'm going to just agree to disagree on that. I really do think that there were at least six hundred thousand men alone. Yeah, he, he's making assumptions animals. about there not being. Yeah, I mean, it, and, and it's not they're nonsensical assumptions. In, you know, in my opinion, I mean, it's just yeah. you you cannot populate. Exactly the promised land with a hundred thousand people and take cities and, and suffer casualties. And you can't, you just can't do that. I mean, you look at the numbers that they lost just from some of the plagues and some of the different things. It's like, yeah. And the battles and the battles. Yeah. yeah. If If it was a small camp, then look what happened when Balaam tried to curse them. You know, he said, it said that, uh, I think it's the numbers, where, uh, you know, Balaam, when the story of the donkey, you know, he was up there yeah. because the the king of, was it Moab, that tried to, you know, hire this guy to curse him. Yeah, I can't remember which one. It was one of them, yeah. Yeah. It's, and so he brings him up to this mountaintop, and he, sh- he starts showing uh, Balaam the, the uh, what do you call it, the encampment of the Israelites. But it was so vast that he had to go to other mountain peaks to see the full thing. Yeah. So, so, I mean, so like 100,000 people, that's yeah. like one stadium. That's like a modern, a large modern day stadium. Modern stadium. That's it. If you, you know, people say, wow, that's still a lot of people like, for 2 million, for example. But if you look at the largest gatherings for like religious gatherings on earth, like Wikipedia has a list. Some, there's some websites out there that ha- has a list. Like in India, when they have some of these religious um, events for the Hindus, uh, they have over 10 million people, I believe, or up to 10 million come at once in the, to like some of these uh, religious gatherings. And you look at Mecca, they have up to 2 million people show up. Uh, so it's not impossible. Is this today? It's, it's, it is kind of hard to fathom uh, having you know one or two million people 
But as you mentioned, people gather together to watch a football game, and you can have up to 100,000 people in one little spot. Uh, so it, um, if you look at the Israelites back then, and, and they always go back to, well, the archaeology says there was that, not that many people living in ancient Egypt during the late Bronze Age. And again, I think with archaeology, we don't understand, like, where are all the graves uh, even today? They have not found or their bones have disappeared, disintegrated. Uh, we have some, the mummies and we have some graves, like the people working on the pyramids. But you don't just go out there and find tons of graves of people from the ancient times. It's very rare. Uh, so, so there's a lot of missing graves, put it that way. And it has to do probably just with nature, you know, grave robbery or just the, 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 the bones uh, disintegrating over time. Uh, but uh, so I, I, on this point, I disagree with him that uh, I think you do need a large enough beach. Um, his next point has to do with this name. And this is where I don't even agree with. But he was making the whole point um, uh, right here, the meaning of Nueva. Uh, there's an individual out there um, who says that Nueva, there's, there's basically on one of the older maps, it says Nueva al Muzina. And they say al Muzina means Moses and it means water or split. <laughs> so they, they believe. And, and so that, that, you know, when I heard that, I was like, wow, this is evidence. You know, there's an old map that says this is the Red Sea crossing. Well, no, it's not the case. I even asked my Egyptian friends who live in Nueva and uh, other Egyptians who speak Arabic. Um, they, I've asked them, I said, okay, what does this mean? And here's the map. Kind of blurry, kind of zoom in to fill the screen. But um, the red points out to Nueva Al Muzina. Uh, this is Wadi, Wit uh, Wadi Wittir that way. And this is Nueva Beach, the yellow that's sticking out there. Um, but if you notice, south of Nueva is this dot. It's going up another Wadi, another canyon is where this actual name is. It's the name of a spring there. Uh, but the name, I talked to a friend there, an Egyptian friend, and he said it has to do with um, like people, like the women, they put on their makeup, they get more beautiful for um, either a wedding ceremony or something. But he said uh, um, there's also a tribe named after the same name or close to that name that has nothing to do with Musa. Like and when people saw that, they're like, the individual who, pr who promotes this, um, uh, he says, oh, Musa Ina means the water of Moses. It, it does not. Uh, this is, so I agree with, uh, uh, with Dr. Falk on this, and it's sad that um, I have to say that. Well, there's always things, <laughs> so, yeah, though. This, yeah, there's always, like, myths and things that people come up with. Yeah. But, you know, the thing is, they like... They want to enhance the story. Yeah, the, the thing is, I just think from a scientific, yeah. like, a perspective of reason and logic, that's the yeah. only place that people could have crossed. Oh, yeah. That is the only place. I, I, I want to show you one. Um, no, it's, let me see where the slide is. Okay, it's after this point I'll make. Then we get into the bathymetric map showing why this is the only place they could cross. <clears throat> um, uh, so th this next section, let me finish this one, and then I'll show you this map, and it exactly um, fits in what you're talking about uh, when you look at uh, the science um, and not just some of these names people are confused with. So the next thing, uh, you know, an individual, the same individual who says – uh, or the same kind of group that say Muzina means Musa, um, and they're wrong on that, sadly. But uh, they also say that the beach is um, fused. And so this is physical proof that the sand is now cemented. So that, that means the column of fire that was um, dividing the camp of Israel from the Egyptians. Okay. So as it went behind the Israelites, it melted the beach somehow. And then somehow Pharaoh's chariot still went on it. And the, 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 Israel, and the Egyptian army was still walking on this hot sand. Um, I don't know how that happened. But anyways, <laughs> he was, you know, I, I, and I, I don't want to make fun because, you know, I know these people who are making these claims and some of them are friends of mine. But um, this is the photo of the beach. This is, we were here, you did a sermon there. I was going to say, I did a little, um, the tiny church. little sermonette there, yeah. Yeah, exactly. And where we're standing, I think we even talked about this phenomena. It's a natural geo geological phenomena where, um, and I, I read it earlier because we were talking about this with another friend a couple months ago, and I forgot. But you're saying it has to do with calcite deposit, I believe. You know, as water rushes, uh, rainstorms uh, mixes uh, from you know from the hills coming down over this type of rock and sand mixes with the salt water. Okay, um, it forms this deposit that covers the beach in certain areas of the world, and this happens around the world. This is not unique here. You find it up in the Gulf of Aqaba, the tip, which has nothing to do with the Red Sea crossing. Down uh, Magna, I've seen it there uh, in Saudi Arabia, uh, you know, far south of the Nueva crossing. In California, they have this. In other beaches, okay, you can look up. Um, well, maybe the Wikipedia. pillar of fire was in California. <laughs> so here's yeah exactly you know that's what some of the critics will say because it, it, it's sad because these uh you know you have the proof that this is the red sea crossing yeah. or you know you have the great logic you know the science of the bathymetric charts and the geology 
then you have people adding on more just to make it more yeah, yeah. <laughs> fantastic. And now you have to disprove that because now it looks really bad. And this is what you know Dr. Falk is attacking. So this is not from the Red Sea crossing, but it's the exact same phenomenon where it forms this hardened um, cement-like structure and basically glues everything together. Uh, looks like cement. But when you look closely, and here's another beach. You know, this is this off Google search. I looked up the term. Um, they call it beach rock. Um, is one term it's used. And it's around the world. Uh, but here's an example at the Nueva Crossing of what they're talking about. And here's a seashell. It's not that <clears throat> seashell is not just laying on the beach. It's actually embedded in this stuff here, and it's like a hard rock, but wow. it's not. You have, so you have seashells. Um, uh, here's oh, this is a really good proof why it's not what people say it is. Uh, so we were. This is the Saudi Arabian side of the Nueva Crossing, and my tour group uh, last year we were there. We were walking along. And one of this guy um, noticed it looked like a tire iron rod was uh, kind of embedded. Oh, in the okay, beach stuff. okay. Like had, this stuff formed around this modern equipment, and so he was able to dig it out and he pulled it out of that cement like um, stru- uh, you know for whatever you call it, so uh, secretion. And uh, he pulled it up and we were looking at it and definitely it was a, a tire iron rod. Uh, so it's modern; it's not a spoke on the Egyptian chariot wheel. Um, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> b- but what it shows. Is that this stuff forms over rocks, uh, seashells, modern stuff? It just covers it, and over time, it'll form this hardened material. Uh, and it's not has nothing to do with melting. There's no evidence that the, the the seashells were melted, that the rocks were melted into glass. It had nothing to do with high heat. It's just a natural phenomena. And so, someone thought it was in their best interest to add more to the story by trying to say, "Hey, this is proof of the fire, the pillar of fire coming through." Um, and so, roll uh, not roll uh, David. Uh, I think his name is David, but Dr. Falk um, uh, attacks this point. And, you know, he's right that it, it is a natural um, – here, oh, here it is. I actually put it in one of the slides. It's natural calcite coating from the calcium carbonate dissolved in seawater, and then it pers- pers- precipitated back onto the land. And when it evaporates, it, it forms this deposit. And so – and it happens all over the world. Uh, so it's not unique to Nueva, and definitely uh, I've seen it up and down the Gulf myself. So don't use that um, argument for the uh, for the Red Sea crossing. Yeah, but, yeah so I, <laughs> yeah. But let's go on to the next one. We, we were just talking about. We appreciate the, the heart of those who uh, you know are, are passionate, like we yeah, are. Not, but <laughs> and even Doctor Fall got to pull back know, the leash a, a little bit. They're <laughs> 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 going to hell. <laughs> You, del- you can edit that part out. No. <laughs> so, the, the next point um, that Dr. Falk, who's a, I'm sure he's a really nice guy, <laughs> he, he, he wants to attack the Nueva Crossing. He says that um, this is the worst crossing site because it's so deep. Now, it is true that back in the 90s, uh, there were uh, some bad data. It was a U.S. Navy database for bathymetric data around the world. It was a global data set, so covering the Earth. Uh, but it was very bad for um, the resolution near like these narrow gulfs and near the continental plates and near the beaches. It was bad resolution. So when when this type of map was published <clears throat> in Ron White's newsletters in the mid 1990s, uh, I, I and they listed the data set. So I went and contacted the Navy, found out I talked to the scientists um, and they told me, well, this like I just said, this is the worst thing to use to to get a good high res- resolution map of the Gulf of Aqaba. And they put me in contact with Dr. John uh, K. Hall from uh, Hebrew University at the time, and he's still alive. Uh, and Dr. Hall, uh, you know, it was so nice to send me, um, uh, he shipped a, a big tube from Israel, and inside there were all his maps that he had made, including this map here, which I had uh, scanned in, and now this is freely available on their the, uh, one of their geological websites in Israel. Uh, you can download the full map of the Gulf of Aqaba. And this is where, the part that's zoomed in. And so he had the best data. And, yes, it does show that the middle of the Gulf right here, this is Nueva here, um, it's 850 meters down. And so if you do the for Americans, that's, you know, what, 2,400 feet or so uh, for, the, uh, uh, for the non-metric system. So then you're like, wow, that's pretty deep. It is. Um, but at the same time, uh, you do have, they call the a lot deep, up north, uh, over 950 meters deep, and then especially the uh, the Argonies deep, just south of the Red Sea crossing, going down to 1,800 uh, meters deep. Uh, so uh, basically, you have these two deep ends, and in between them, they call it. And this is where even Dr. Falk is uh, attacking people who say it's a um, underwater bridge, you know, land bridge. 
it, it is correct that it is not a land bridge. You can't call that. Uh, what, what they do call it, and what I call it is a walkable path. There's no underwater sea cliffs here. Look yeah, at here. Yeah, this yeah. map right here. You see how those um, <clears throat> black lines are really close together? That means the topography there is almost vertical. So it's an underwater sea cliff like you have it, uh, in Hawaii at some of those, uh, those cliffs that go deep underwater. And you have the same thing along most of the Gulf of Aqaba except for Nueva. Nueva, you can see that the black yeah, lines it's very easy are to more see. spread apart. No, it, it, it's a more gentle slope. The uh, ratio, um, the um, the angle of travel is walkable. So I call it a walkable path. I don't get into involved, you know, because the, the land bridge is a geological term. So you'll have people, even like Dr. Hall from the Hebrew University, tell me, no, there's no land bridge here. And so I thought, well, of course there's no land bridge. But so then the next question is, is it walkable if there's no land bridge? Yes, it is deep, and yes, it's walkable. Uh, here's another um, chart that was done by the uh, – actually, the Saudis did this. One of their recent studies they've been doing on the Gulf of Aqaba because of the NEON project. So they combined their half of the Gulf. They did um, survey work there, and then they combined it with the other um, results from the Israelis and the Germans. And so they made this really nice map. But again, it does show – this nice area here that has um, no vertical sea cliffs. You have the submarine, um, you know, they call them fans, basically this underwater gentle slope coming down from the Weba. The same with the Saudi side, it comes down. And then here's a good map that um, I want to get to this, but I should have put this one first. This was done by Dr. Glenn Fritz, who believes the Weba is the Red Sea crossing, and he believes Sinai is in Arabia. And he got his PhD on about the Exodus route um, and especially the Red Sea crossing itself and where the Red Sea was. Uh, so if you look at his chart here and you uh, look at the top one, this is the gentle slope. And this is, I believe, drawn to a certain scale. I don't know. But at any rate, um, he does give the, um, the position. So negative you know, 750 meters is right to here. So this is 850 meters. I mean, it looks very walkable that generally, to me. You know that? Yeah, it generally goes down. And I forgot the, um, uh, you know, the, re- the, the angle that it's done at. Um, cause you, you can do the trigonometry. Six degree, I've heard can, six degrees. I don't know if that's accurate or not, but that's what I've heard. Yeah, yeah I forget. Someone can leave a comment and tell us. Yeah. But um, but anyway, it is walkable. Uh, there's steeper paths out there in the world for hiking and, and also uh, people, you know, for cars and so driving on some of the roads. Uh, you know, you have to have it gentle enough so the chariots can go down into it and then people and their carts for the Israelites. Now, if you look at the other places along the Gulf of Aqaba that has a beach sticking out, they're much smaller beaches, um, and they're going across uh, the, these areas here. When they go across, you get into this very deep area that has almost under – like there's sea cliffs coming back up to the Saudi side. So it's not walkable uh, on one side or the other or both. Now, here's the one site that is – uh, proposed along the Gulf of Aqaba by um, uh, a number of people like uh, Bob Cornuke and Larry Williams. They made it popular uh, back in the 90s. And this is the Straits of Tehran. But even that one down there at the uh, the tip of the, Gulf, uh, the Sinai Peninsula has a very um, deep area that has basically underwater sea cliffs. And, and it doesn't go down as deep as 850 meters. It goes down to maybe like 300 meters here. But the angle... Of that water of the underground um, topography, there the water, uh, yeah. the land is very steep. So, but to me, that's too much of a coincidence. Out. Everything that you're saying about that top, uh, yeah. the Nueva crossing Everything location, has, it's like that. It, and, yeah. and these guys, what they do, they try to, uh, you know, they'll use language where they'll say it, it's it, they're they're arguing over terminology as opposed to actually looking at the facts, like. When you yeah. look at Instead that with your eyes, bridge, like yeah. people can yeah. cross over that. It's not, you know, absurd. I think it's absurd to try to say that it's, it, that it's not. It's the only place, like is the only place no. that they could cross that uh, eastern and, arm yeah. of the Red Sea. The only place. Yeah, and, and, and where they fall back on, they, they'll say, well, if you look at the Hebrew text, and they're, they're assuming that they know exactly how God split the Red Sea. They will look at the verse that talks about the east wind. Uh, and they'll say, well, that's it. It was, it was because of a wind that, that it moved the water. And so they're looking at a very shallow area near the Mediterranean Sea, usually, yeah. uh, on those lakes. David Roll say, said well, that to me in our, in our uh, discussion. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's this wind. But if you look at the verse um, that talks about how like, the, the, the path through the deep, yeah. Uh, yeah. hurled the, you know, the chariots into the deep. Um, the miracle was not that they drowned in a couple feet of water. The miracle was that God split open, you know, 750 yeah. to 850 meters of water. To, uh, and, and for God, 
that's not impossible. No. And so the wind part, God had the wind going, but it wasn't just a sudden wind. Remember, it said Moses struck the sea yeah, with, the, with his rod. That can mean so many different and, things. I mean, like the wind, there being yeah. a, I forget what it said, easterly wind or whatever the, you know, north, yeah. whatever they said. But that could yeah. mean so many different things. And I just feel like it's like reading into the text as opposed to actually just letting the text speak for itself. God did a miracle. Like, I think... I think exactly. that's the headline. A huge miracle. God, <laughs> yeah. God did a miracle, yeah. you know, and, and there was probably an easterly wind blowing. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, exactly. But the wind itself did not, with, you know, you can take God away and say, well, this wind blew through and yeah. created, you know, and split the sea. No, the Bible is really clear that when, when Moses struck it, it split. And then all night long, a wind blew. It, it, it didn't just like um, blow all night long. And then at the end, once the wind did its job, then you had a power. Right, right, right. No, they yeah. were, God all, was drying yeah, out the long, sand. They were actually, he was drying out yeah, exactly. the sand so yeah, they didn't get exactly. sand in their sandals. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. well, I mean, and again, uh, I wasn't there, but I like that idea. <laughs> it's drying out the sand. <laughs> um, and so marching along on this journey from uh, Goshen to Sinai, looking at uh, David Falk's, uh, I keep saying David, I hope it's David, Dr. Falk's um, uh, critique. <laughs> whoever um, you are, we're, uh, yeah, his, we appreciate yeah, your work. Your, whatever your name is. Um, He's going to watch his and wonder who we are. <laughs> who are these <laughs> but, guys? Uh, the next thing he wants to attack is the, uh, the Red Sea crossing, uh, the actual physical archaeological evidence that Ron White was using. So Ron not only used uh, the idea with the mountains and the Wadi Wattir, so that's geography and uh, showing the underwater path. Uh, but Ron also said him and his sons in the late 70s, they came across what looked to be chariot parts. They even took one of these coral shapes up and presented it to the head of antiquities at the time uh, who's no longer around now but this man examined it and told ron that this was a uh, 18th dynasty uh, the remains of an 18th dynasty chariot wheel and ron was surprised like how can you just tell by looking at the shape and the guy then went on to explain that well it was only during the 18th dynasty that you had these eight spoke wheels uh, most of the time later on they used six spokes and then early on, they were using four spokes. But only the 18th Dynasty, you had this mix. And a very short number of years, they were using uh, eight-spoke wheels. So it's kind of a way to date. Uh, they, they kind of settle on the design with six spokes being the best. And you see that being used all the way up uh, into the time of Ramses and the 19th Dynasty later on. But what the, the thing that Ron took up, it was like the hub was covered in coral. But it had, um, he said, there's eight pieces of coral or whatever coming up. So he was able to count those as being spokes on the wheel, according to this uh, Egyptian uh, antiquities guy who said, you know, this is the 18th dynasty. Uh, and of course, so if you're wondering, what does that mean? Well, for those who believe that 1446 is the Exodus, which is 480 years before um, uh, King Solomon, you know, during, uh, I believe, when he uh, uh, was building the uh, temple yeah. or the <clears throat> dedication. So if you go backwards, you get to 1446. That's a traditional chronology uh, that most uh, conservative scholars accept. Now, of course, Dr. Falk and others, they want to do a 19th dynasty, which is later, the next family that ruled, the Ramses family. Uh, so, uh, But at any rate, Ron believed he had found proof that there was uh, Egyptian chariots in this area. And so if you look at some of his photographs, uh, one, here's a four-slope one. Um, and this was the one he believed was covered in gold. He says very fragile. He tried to touch and move it. It was the very thin veneered metal, and so he left it there um, where it was at, and with the sifting uh, sand down there and the current going over that fill, or you know, the so-called land bridge, the, um, that shelf between the two deep ends, uh, is a really high current down below uh, underwater there, and so it's just, uh, always the sand is moving back and forth. Um, in fact, some friends went back in the, uh, I think it was 2000, um, so about 12 years after Ron had found it, and I was on that trip in 2000, so a year after Ron had passed away, we were trying to look for this thing. And um, the last person who saw the area, he said the sand it was actually at the top of the – there's a column of uh, coral right here. And he said the sand was at the top of that coral. Holy cow. Uh, and so you can see how much sand – there's like eight feet of sand. In yeah. fact, we brought in equipment. My friend from California had brought in this suction – underwater suction equipment to suck all the sand out. Um, so we had a big team. We just couldn't find the spot anymore. Because, you know, the big area there. Wow, that, that's uh, amazing. Anyway, you guys photo, went back there. We went back to try to find it. Yeah. You know? uh, but because of the, the underwater just totally changing, even the guy who knew the spot before, he, he didn't recognize any features down there. And he didn't know where to start. Uh, so we spent three days on a boat trying to do this. 
Um, the, the, some of these are a little blurry because it's zoomed in or, or video still frames. But, you know, Ron took a video. Now, someone said, well, where is this? Why didn't he take it up? Again, he said it was very fragile. Uh, so he left where it was. <clears throat> and he was not the only one who saw this. When Ron found this in 87 or 88, um, he had another man with him who was on the boat looking down on the water. It's very clear. This is 80 feet down maybe underwater. But because of how clear it is, like from the boat, you can see objects down on the sea floor. Um, and this individual actually drew – so this was March 20th, 1988 wow. was when they found it. This, this gentleman, Alfred Lee, I think he's still around. Uh, he was a, an artist. But Ron took him there because he knew the guy and he wanted to show this guy this, the wheel. And, and the guy drew what he saw from the top looking down in the water. Um, so there was a witness who saw it. Now, people have said these are um, – the four-spoke ones especially, these are valve handles on um, boats. You know, maybe some are. No, those are solid, like brass or bronze. Um, and there's a port nearby um, on that southern end of the Red Sea uh, on Nueva. Um, but that port was built, um, you know, years later too. Um, but at any rate, these, um, you know, some of these definitely could be modern artifacts. Others, they need to be pulled up. So I, you know, I'm not going to say Ron, uh, like <laughs> Dr. Falks in his in his attack, he, he put up a big thing saying it's fraudulent claim, proven to be false. And that Ron, like maybe Ron planted this or uh, made up the whole thing. <laughs> um, yeah. So uh, I, I don't. I'm I not like how people go to the things. darkest possible place. You know, it's like yeah, yeah right away. Ah, <laughs> uh, he. Yeah. So and even if it no, was, I, let's say that it was a uh, you know a ship, a boat, wheel, or you know, it's like valve, yeah. yeah. Like why? Why was he a liar? Like why? <laughs> Like, yeah, you know. yeah, he misinterpreted the data, yeah, yeah. Uh, and people could do that. You can't, but it doesn't uh, take away from the other points. Yeah, about yeah, it being yeah, a walkable yeah. path, the large beach, the mountains, the wilderness. Yeah, it's just it's crazy. And, and there's more we'll talk about on this. But so here's some of the pictures that Dr. Falk is attacking. Is saying, well, people claim that there are coral shapes. Okay, yeah. We, again, we don't know what's underneath these coral shapes, uh, but this is what was Ron's. Uh, you know, besides talking about Nueva Beach itself. This was some of the stuff that he and, and others had presented saying, well, these could possibly be chariot wheels. And, uh, and Tim Mahoney's film, they talk about that. Could chariot wheels even last that long for coral to grow? Uh, and could they, could they even survive under the sand? You know, it all depends on the water conditions, whether they could last. And what type of metal could survive? They say brass could, copper. Um, uh, so you know, most of the wheels are wood. You know, most of the material made in the wheels are wood with limited metal. And if they had gilded ones covered in thin gold, then you know, then how would they survive? The gold would definitely survive, but the wood wouldn't. So you have a lot of questions. I usually don't dwell because I personally have not seen a chariot wheel, so I don't dwell on this. I do say Ron thought he saw one. And yeah, other people. Have, it's irrelevant to me because I think yeah, yeah. The, the other evidence is so overwhelming. You know, it, it's just you know, it's interesting. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's interesting. People think they've seen yeah, chariot wheels down there. Especially if you put it all together. I, that's like not why I case. believe it, but you know, believe that this is the yeah, location. It, yeah, so like, for example, if let's say you found one of these uh, round shapes down there, this is it's a it's a wheel, but it's an underwater sea cliff, you know, then it wouldn't fit because then you have these right yeah, repelling yeah, yeah. off the sea cliff. Yeah, so <laughs> with everything fitting, then you're like, hmm, well maybe they were suicidal. They just evidence. drove off the cliff. They were... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's it, it's yeah. That's we talk about some of these other crossing sites. But that's exactly right. Uh, so then he, uh, Doctor Falk, briefly talks about. Well, they say they're the human bones and and horse hoofs found down there. And they did pull up bones in um, this one uh, that's kind of dehydrated, but it was in the water, a horse hoof. And so he rightly says, like, we don't know who these belong to. It could have been, you know, someone from 10 years ago versus uh, the, the actual Egyptian yeah, army. Yeah. Uh, true. But the whole point is, you know, they're finding these things at this site versus finding nothing. So um, anyways, moving on. Uh, now, this one's kind of interesting because I've done some research on this um, uh, about the pillar. Now, there's only one pillar found, but Ron claimed there were two originally, uh, and he found the second one in 84 when he was captive uh, in Saudi Arabia, and he said that he found a matching one. This is the Egyptian one that the Israeli soldiers stuck up in the cement and still standing there. Uh, so you see that on our tour group. Now, Dr. Falk, looking at this, says, well, this is Nabataean Roman era, so, you know, second uh, temple era, uh, that time period. Others have said, well, if it's Solomon, you do have pillars <laughs> In it's a cylindrical of, uh, rock. Like, how do they say that it's? <laughs> well, they're, they're looking at the top here. Yeah, uh, yeah. And, and there's some things that are very similar. They're just so broken. Off. Exactly. Yeah, it's just hard to really make out. 
it's not an exact science yeah. on on on. And I, it's not like a like you can tell uh, a Greek pillar, for example, from yeah. If something you, but else. you don't have that here. You have just a little oh. piece of of something that's broken off. You, it you don't know what. That and here's is. the other thing, it, which which is so strange. It's all by itself. Yeah. You know, usually you find a pillar. It's part of a building or something else. There is nothing else. There's not like a whole bunch of these laid around. Ron Wyatt one, planted it there. Stuck it up. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> liar. Him and his yeah, son, it's a... just carrying it on the, <laughs> yeah, on the back. Yeah. I, I mean, and, and in fact, that's what they'll say next. Is that Ron somehow yeah. planted Him and his sons. Well, hey, his know, sons I, with him. They carried it. You know what? Actually, let me let me say this. The the guy, um, I think it was Falk or someone else, they, they talked to. No, it wasn't Falk. I think it was Steve Rudd. Um, who who runs Bible.ca, and and they he believes Sinai is in Saudi Arabia at the same mountain, but he attacks anything Ron Wyatt, so it's kind of strange. But he so he believes in the Strait of Tehran Red Sea crossing instead of this site in Nueva. And he talked to uh, Rittmeyer, who's a, a well-known um, a British uh, architect who worked on a lot of the Temple Mount excavations, drawing up what the, the Temple Mount looked like in the time of King Herod and all that. Well, he, this guy, I think he was quoting Rittmeyer, another gentleman, and the guy was claiming, well, I've been to the Nueva many, many th- times in the 70s, and I never saw a, a pillar on the beach. So Ron found this in 77, I think it was. And so basically what the guy's inferring is that basically Ron somehow made up this pillar or planted it somehow. Anyway, I don't know I mean, what that's, he's That's a big pillar. That... You know, it's 20 feet or 20 Yeah, that's not – if people are looking at the picture, that's massive. Another, like... Yeah. And plus underground. Um, it used to be you could see the bottom part of it. Now it's actually all covered up. Um, I was just there earlier this year, and now they have the freeway on either side open. So you have to actually stop in the middle area to get out to see this. And it's all um, – they took all the trash away. So it's all um, – it's not landscape, but it's, it's flat. So you can walk out there with your tour group. And um, But you can't see the bottom anymore because they covered it up so it won't fall over. But in the past, there was like – someone had dug to see underneath. You can see there's like two or three feet more of this pillar that goes past the cement that the Israeli soldiers had put up. So the whole point is there's a lone pillar on one side. And Dr. Falk is right that we don't have a photograph of the other pillar because that's the pillar that's the most important one because Ron claimed that on that pillar had these ancient inscriptions in ancient Hebrew that said Solomon's name, the Pharaoh, uh, Moses, uh, death of Pharaoh, you know, the land of Edom and Egypt. So all these key words are basically tied into the Red Sea crossing. And Ron said he had saw that when the, uh, when the Saudis brought him to the beach on the Saudi side of the crossing and wanted to verify his story because he was saying, I'm not an Israeli spy like his so-called friend you know, t- called the embassy and said he was. That's why they got arrested. But he was looking for the exodus route. He was claiming the Weibo was the crossing. So they went over there by helicopter from Hackel because there was no road at that time um, but a dirt track through the area. And so they landed by helicopter, according to Ron, and they saw a pillar still standing that matched the same design. But this one had the text still on it. Um, and he was claiming it had all these keywords. Uh, when he met the Caldwells, like uh, that was 85. So in 1991, I think they started investigating this area. And so six, year, uh, you know, six years later uh, or seven years later, he's over here. They're over there looking. He tells them, go to that spot where he saw the pillar. And so when they went there, the only thing that they could see um, – Let's see. So, okay, yeah, here it is. So here I am standing on. This is the Saudi side of the beach of the Red Sea crossing beach. Um, and so here is what they saw. And this was standing up in the old photographs. Um, this was one of my first trips here. I think even by our tour in 2022, this was missing itself. Uh, so things just slowly decaying and, and going um, away. But um, what it was is a metal survey marker set in cement, with, and it had a metal medallion on it, and it said Coastal Survey. So the Saudis had put it up for a coastal survey, but it was in the general area that Ron had saw the pillar. So they, you know, if you find this, they always said that was the area that Ron said the pillar was at. Um, well, so uh, this was like 2016 or 17 that I took this photograph. Later, when we would visit there with groups, even this section was gone. The metal pole was gone. The uh, flight, the metal thing on the top. The cement was gone. So we started building up rocks just to mark the spot. Now, I had the GPS, but um, as we're building up these rocks, we noticed that some locals are watching us in their Jeeps. You know, so uh, you know, we quit. We come back the next day to, to finish our job, and the whole thing is torn down, like just flat. I was like, going to say, I remember like we, we made a rock pile there when we were there. We did too. Well, so when I went there last year, it's gone. It's like, even that rock wow. pile is gone. So and we're like, <laughs> why would they care? In fact, one time we were there. 
two locals came up and demanded they were like this, you know, wanted to see your passport and visa. So we showed it, like, you know, <laughs> these are Bedouins. Who, there's a road right here going up to some Bedouin camps in the mountains there. Um, so it, it's very interesting that the locals were concerned that foreigners are stopping here looking at this site. So we went to Hackle, which is the nearby town, about 20 minutes up the road where we stayed uh, during our tour. And, and it's a border town. And, and we thought, you know, Ron was told that they moved the pillar from here to a government storage in Hackle. Dr. Kim, the, uh, the Korean doctor who was the, uh, the doctor for the governor of Mecca, so a very high up position, um, he, when he was researching this, and he speaks fluent Arabic, he talked to a local Bedouin kid, and I think this was 2000, 2001, and that local told him that many years before they had taken the pillar and moved it and dumped it into the ocean, the Gulf of Aqaba, to get rid of it. Wow. Um, wow. So that was, now we have two different stories of what happened yeah, to yeah. this pillar, but people are talking about it. <clears throat> so we, we asked around, my friend and I, we, and this was 2018, I believe. Um, so we're in Hackle. We talked to some friends, your new friends, and they find an old man. And this gentleman said uh, he remembers the pillar. We showed him the, the Nueva one. They said, do you have something similar here? And he said, yes. I, he, I, he, we asked him, well, where is it? So I'll take you to where it was originally located. Um, and so we didn't show him. Like, we didn't say, okay, turn it off here. Like, could we have the GPS from this, the, you know, this broken down marker? We, we knew that spot. We didn't tell him anything. We, we just we put him in our car, and he uh, we drove him down the beach until he told us to stop. And then we got out, and he we walked right. You know, in fact, we actually drove up almost to the site. I remember, he pointed out – he was in the passenger side of the um, SUV. And he pointed out the window. He said, right over there, this is where it was at. And he kept looking up and down the road. He would not get out. And within only a couple minutes, he said, we need to go. So he was very nervous. Um, but he went to the exact same spot where this thing was at. Uh, without us telling them, and he said he remembered that it was standing here, uh, a similar uh, style column. And but his story was that they had dug; he thought they had dug a hole here and just knocked it in and covered it. So maybe it's still in this wadi wash, you know, area that it's just still buried there, or maybe it's out in the Gulf of Aqaba. Someone will find it someday. But the bottom uh, line or, is, it's a very this is interesting. I mean, it's another little piece. Well, what's of interesting, you, you the broader these, picture. Uh, you know, you can just, you have you don't have a photo, but you have locals telling you stories of hey, we know what, yeah. about it, and that they've taken it away. You have people very um, uh, sus- not suspicious, but yeah, suspicious of us being there, but also very concerned about uh, them being there. Like they they didn't want to stay too long. That one guy. Uh, so you know, take it as it is. There could have been a pillar here, according to these local and Ron White. Um, moving on, uh, I know we're running out of time. Uh, let's see. Oh, we are okay. Um, I can just do a couple more points. And then, yeah, take, no, you're, and then it's fine, up. Andrew. Take, I mean, take as much time as you want, man. We'll <clears throat> we'll cover it. You know, you're. Set uh, it down. And- I think too. I, it would just. Yeah, you know, this is what I think would be good to see too, because we've covered the the Red Sea crossing. There, there's a lot of of pieces to this whole argument, and it is. Um, you know, you've got, so yeah, you've got the, the split rock here. I see you're getting into. You got Mount Sinai itself, and yeah. So, um, the, and this so is. I, I don't know if you're going to get into this, but but Northwest Saudi Arabia. I I totally missed that. Uh, maybe an intro you want to give to your <laughs> that incredible shot there, but Northwest Saudi Arabia, where the split rock is and where the, this is where the ancient maps have actually have Sinai being is in Mi, or Midian. Yeah, being. You have, yeah, the, Midian is in this location it, yeah. is in this area. And we're in fact going to talk about how, how that, what that means to, for the location of Sinai. Once you find Midian, how does that relate to Sinai? I uh, know this is a looping video, so we can keep talking. Oh, sweet. Yeah. Like <laughs> 20 seconds. No, what I was going to say is that, yeah, for like we just talked to the first part about, you know, the Red Sea crossing uh, up to then. And now we're into Saudi. So if you even wanted to break it up, you could. Um, but uh, what I was going to mention also is it's very hard to deal with these uh, these critiques really fast because, you know, someone all you have to say is ah, that's not it. <laughs> you have to spend an hour. Yeah, there's a lot more. of components so, here. There's a lot of stuff yeah, to consider, and, and there's a lot and, of... And so it's very easy. Yeah, major yeah. pieces of it's evidence very, that I think show this is the location of Sinai. You, you can't just dismiss them. No, and, and he's had a very... I can understand. You say, okay, I agree to disagree. And, or, or I've met people say, well, this is probably it. I'm not 100% sure, you know, maybe 50-50 or whatever. But when someone has this, you know, that smirk on his face and is kind of laughing it off and like, I'm the expert and you guys are not, you have no archaeology, uh, no training or, 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 or this is all fake stuff. And then I, that's very dismissive attitude. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it just turns me off. <laughs> yeah, hundred percent. Yeah. And, and unfortunately that's what a and lot so of, you know, some... archaeology has become that today. It's just, it's just the scholar with the, yeah. with the opinion and they've 
10 scholars have 10 different well, opinions. Well, which one's right? You know? I was going mean, to say that. It, it, and they make it seem like, well, this is not Sinai. It, so it's like all this. In fact, he ends with saying no archaeologist uh, believes this is Mount Sinai, as if they all believe Sinai is St. Catherine. What he doesn't say is that, like, just what you just said, that you have like 12 different Sinai yeah. by 12 different scholars. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so and they all have their PhD. So who am I going to believe? <laughs> Yeah, but yeah, but anyway, if you, if you, so you know, like, and I think just looking at the—that's what people need to do—is look at the look at the big pieces yeah. of evidence. Like that that location at Nueva, yeah. it's the only place that two million or more, three million people could. Cr- it's the only place that they could cross actually cross the Red Sea. You know, the the, uh, the right. ancient maps show Midian there. They don't show it over in the Sinai Peninsula where Saint Catharines is. Like these are facts. Yeah. Like this is these are big pieces of evidence. Oh. Like for this. This site. You have to reinvent. You have to make up your own maps. <laughs> you can put Midian in. Yeah, no, it's yeah, funny. Yeah. I have people commenting on my YouTube videos, and um, there's this whole group of people. I don't know how they do this, but they say all the events in the Bible happen in Africa or even in America. So I have <laughs> some people leaving comments saying that Noah's Ark and Jerusalem and all these biblical sites are somewhere in Africa. And one person, I don't know if they're just being funny because, you know, it's YouTube comments, but uh, one person keeps saying, oh, it's in uh, somewhere in, like, Pennsylvania or someplace. <laughs> I, I always wanted to say, well, have you been to There's Arctic a Gehenna, County? Ohio. Like, close. I live in Ohio. There's a Gehenna. Yeah. Like, <laughs> I don't I think it's the same say, place the Bible's it, it, talking about. <laughs> very close to the one in, was it, Kentucky or Ohio? Where's the, the Arctic Counter in Kentucky? Oh, that, yeah, that's in Kentucky. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't know the <laughs> so, name of the city. The one who said it was Kentucky. maybe. So, you know, you have people, like, their geography is way off. It just makes zero sense. But when you look at the real, like, when you look at uh, where the Bible says Midian is, where archaeologists are looking for it or finding the evidence – yeah. Uh, this always it's almost non dispute. You know, you have the fringe people saying you know, the earth is flat and, and and Africa has Noah's Ark. But you know, the real deal is in northwest Saudi Arabia. And this is an area that in the past you could not get access to. It's very hard to do scientific work. Now it's open up. You have all these papers being published about the different work being done in Tama, Elula, Albada, um um uh Kuraira, you know, all these different archaeological sites that are uh, have, were around during the Bronze Age, the late Bronze Age, the time of the Exodus, and associated with where the Midianites ended up at. Uh, so uh, I, I think there's more discoveries to be made on the professional side. Uh, and so I'm, I think those who are just saying, no, it's not happened, like nothing happened over there, like uh, Dr. Falk ends up saying at the end of his video that Mount Sinai, the, the, the Jebel Makla, the Jebel Allah's range, that, he says, is just a Nabataean site. There's no Bronze Age, no late Bronze Age, <laughs> the time of the Exodus. And, and just basically what the Saudis used to say, but now they don't say it. They used to say everything that happened in that area was either Nabataean, they claim, or Neolithic, uh, which is you know, the new Stone Age. So they, they, And they left everything in the middle gone. They said, oh, there's no evidence that people yeah, lived yeah. out here. And of course, that, that area there, that, that time period that they said is all missing, that's the, the Old Testament period. Yeah. Uh, as you can see, there's well, I think you have to now. look at these things. You know, you, you have to, you have to, you have to acknowledge like that there's in that rock right there is megalithic. I mean, it's like 200 feet high. The one that you got yeah. the video of yeah, right now. It's, it's like, it's going to loop. <laughs> yeah. It just, it just happens to be there. There just happens to be this, this, uh, you know, know. underwater pathway. <laughs> there just, it just happens to be there. Like you have to acknowledge, like yeah. at some point you've got to at least say it's reasonable. Like yeah. you can't just yeah. discredit it. Like the, the, wanna... the biggest problem with the other view is saying that there's, the, the the amount of people like is nonsensical to me. Like if you don't have two million people, you can't even have the events of the Exodus. Like it doesn't it doesn't happen. You don't have like a, a, a huge migration of people. And and if it is that large, if the group is that large, which it had to be, then to to take over the promised how land. People, how many people died in the plague? Uh, you know, I think thousands. In, um, they had thousands Acts. die in all these different yeah. yeah. Yeah, and you're looking back and like, well, if it's ten thousand people, you you just killed most All of, of them. Group. Yeah, they're dead. You're in the <laughs> negatives. Like you got zombies now. Yeah, zombies. especially if it's ten thousand. <laughs> one of them was like <laughs> Walking say, Dead took over. The, took over Israel. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it, exactly. I mean, that's how their logic is like. I know we're laughing, but <laughs> that's exactly what you end up being. You had the ghost. <laughs> well, I'll get off this video here. I just wanted to show as we we're talking what it was like. So he hit, the next point that he wanted to make about this, and he, again, he's laughing at it. He said. 
oh, well, you know, there's first he makes a couple points. Well, I'll get to this point first, and then I'll get to the Bible verse. At first, he says that uh, um, that it, when, there's wind erosion in the area, which is true, uh, but that, that there's no proof that there was ever water that flowed out of here. Now, at the bottom of this rock, you do have a lot smoother stones. You walked up there. You've explored you and your son and, and our tour group. Uh, so you have smoother areas. My whole point is, okay, I, I don't know how much, what, what's the percentage created this by wind erosion since the time of the Exodus, you know, 3,500 years ago, versus what about, uh, you know, rivers of water that Psalm says came out of the rock of Horeb. And, and, and let's say they were there two, three, four days, maybe a week. We don't know the exact time frame they stayed at Rephidim before they moved on. Um, and so what about that volume of water to feed the one or two million people or 100,000 people? Uh, in a short period of time, that's going to create erosion that normally would take thousands of years. And so combination-wise, yes, you have wind hitting these rocks, and it's a very soft, brittle rock, um, and then you you have very little rain and water in this area. There's no oasis nearby. So you can see why the Israelites complained. It gets very hot on this side of the Jebel Allah's range. This is the west side. The lower elevation, hotter temperatures, no water right here. There's big plains all around it. That you could say the Israelites encamped in. So you have space for the battlefield with the Malachites, which happened at Rephidim. You have this giant rock that's split in two that's standing on a hill. Uh, and, and it does stand out like a sore thumb. And in fact, it does look like a hand, they say. I mean, I didn't so, see anything else that looked like that when we were all the driving around, well, we did. They're smaller. No, they're smaller, but rock, of course, rocks split. You know, that's yeah. part of nature process. Um, the whole point is, you know, God didn't say I'll create the only split rock in the world. Yeah, but, but it's very, that one's that very I unique, will, though. I mean, it's it's very it prominent. It's, it's on this hill. Yeah. It's uh, prominent. And here's the interesting part: we talked to a local. Will be I talked to a friend or acquaintance who knows a local, and, and this guy does tours over there. He said, Andrew, uh, we just met a local guy who was actually born at the base of this rock. He's a Bedouin who lives in, I think, now Alabama. <laughs> and the guy said, um, uh, he said, well, guess what? We, we know, like, we've talked about this area. People know this rock. It stands out. You know, in the Bible account, it says that Mo, you know, God told Moses, stand at the rock of Horeb or, and strike the rock. You know, the whole area is covered in rocks, different sizes. There's no trees hardly around. And so how would Moses know what is the rock of Horeb? It had to be something that was prominent. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and so this guy who was born there, his name, and let's just, I don't know if it was Muhammad. Let's just say his name was Muhammad. It, the locals would call him, um, you know, like I'm from Sacramento. Most of my life I lived in Northern California. You can say I'm Andrew of Sacramento versus <laughs> Andrew of uh, San Francisco. You know, that, that, that's how they kind of did it. Yeah, you know, yeah. They kind of your name versus where you're born, you know, with where you're born. And so his name was, his name, I want to say it's Muhammad, but Muhammad of the Rock. That was wow. your local okay. saying, yeah, I know it's Muhammad of the Rock. They knew it's the guy who was born at the base of this rock. He not sprung out of the water. Place. He sprung out of you know, the water so, from but, the, but the whole point, you know, this is the spot that he was born. And I thought that was so cool that the guy's name was associated with the rock yeah. and people knew what that meant. Oh, it really? I, this, it's just oh, another – oh, yeah. like, like a hand it, yeah. standing up. You know, it's really cool. I mean, when I was there my first time, this was the most special site. Uh, I, I climbed the mountain back in 2016. That was that was awesome being up there. And then, but this was one of our, my three miracles on that trip was we got access to this site because we had no idea it would be closed down because they told us it's a military zone. At the top, it was that radar station. But if you got caught back here, you would be kicked out or worse. And we got kicked out on our second trip in. But that first trip, 2016. Uh, April, uh, we drove in. No one was around. We had camels come by. We had a really awesome view of the camels walking in front of the rock, all in a line. We spent a couple hours in the area. No Bedouin bothered us, no local. Um, but at any rate, uh, I think you look at the location being on the west side of the mountain range, and it's in the region of Horeb. If, if Horeb is a region and you're still on the other side of the mountain, so you're still part of Horeb or Mount Sinai, uh, you have all this stuff add up. The, the the erosion, whether it's just wind or wind and water, you have a giant split rock. And this is the thing where Dr. Falk, I think he, um, he he's trying to overstate his point here. He's trying to say that, oh, in Isaiah, we're, we're reading the text that God split the rock. He said the Hebrew doesn't say that. He, he doesn't, well, so I had to look that up. I, I don't know if he doesn't think anyone's going to look up what he says, but Dr. Falk is claiming that that uh, the the verses do not mention a split rock. I think it says cleaved, think, well, doesn't it? Say cleaved, isn't that the? Well, there's, well, there's d- depends on your tra- like your English word you're going to use in the translator. <clears throat> uh, but 
exactly. Here's the um, these are ESV right here, and it does say Psalm seventy eight and even Isaiah forty eight where he quotes. But I remembered the Psalms. I looked it up. It's Psalm seventy eight fifteen, and it does say he split. I'm talking about God, he split rocks in the wilderness and gave them drink abundantly as from the deep. And then I looked it up on my software, my Bible software. Just trying to, what does it say for split? You know, is it just a made up word, or is that added in by the translators? No, there's a Hebrew word, and it actually, like you said, it means cleave, it means split, it means break open, break apart. Um, so they're correct, and you can see yeah, what they yeah. wrote. So, hey. and so it just seems the, like no. people that just don't want to believe, just don't want to give it no. a shot, you I know, haters. Agree. I mean, yeah. you know, in modern vernacular, it's like, hey, there's just haters. Yeah, but uh, to, to, to be like saying there, there's not even a verse that says that you split the rocks when the other, Psalm 78, 15. Um, he, he was disputing Isaiah 48, but no, Psalm 78, 15 definitely says he split the rocks, and it's the same um, uh, concept used in Psalms 48, or Isaiah 48. Uh, so uh, his idea is that, okay, it's a, it's a rock that Moses struck, and the water like poof, you know, came out, um, but the visual effect of a split rock is, is biblical. It's not just made up by us. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, um, you, you could say the same thing about what he's saying, too. I mean, about reading into, you know, I mean, anybody who is, uh, we're literally looking at a document yeah. that's three and a half thousand years old in the in the Pentateuch. Yeah. I mean, so uh, yeah. how, we're all, you know, to a certain degree. I mean, you're, you're going to take your oh, yeah, water. But that, it seems pretty clear, yeah. you know, in, in either way, whatever somebody, like the other pieces of evidence that, that we've shown here, it, whatever somebody believes about the split rock, like this particular split rock is irrelevant, like... I will say it's very powerful. It is a very powerful visual when you see it. And it definitely is more right, unique yeah. than anything I've seen, you know, there or elsewhere in the world. I mean, in terms of like the location, yeah, it yeah. happens well, to be in example, this location. You happen know, to have these stories that talk about a split rock, yeah. like, but no, nothing. There's no connection. Yeah. There's no connection. <laughs> <laughs> nothing well, happened here, folks. Like they say. <laughs> What do they say? Location, location, location. Or so yeah, or at least yeah, or at least don't say we're you know crazy for making yeah. some of these connections. I mean, yeah, they should say, say you know I don't agree with it, but I can understand why somebody does. You know, like yeah, exactly. Instead, it's no, nope, you guys are the crazy ones, and ha ha ha, you guys are nuts. <laughs> well, no, you. And he should have mentioned Psalm seventy-eight if he's going to attack the reading of Isaiah forty-eight. And say, oh, we're we're inferior, you know, what's in the verse, we're putting our bias in it. Well, if you look at Psalm 78, it does say split or cleave, you know, it's a similar concept in English, but the Hebrew word's there. Uh, so anyways, so moving on to Sinai. So this is the point where, uh, this is the place where he really uh, goes after, like, is Jebel laws Jebel, like, is that the real Mount Sinai? Uh, and he's a traditional guy. So if you look at a map, I have one right here. Um, the green arrow points to Northwest Arabia, the land of Midian right here. Um, you look over, I feel like a weather reporter. If we look over here. <laughs> location, um, location, the weather location. Saint, <laughs> the weather right now in St. Catherine <laughs> is stormy. <laughs> um, so this is the traditional uh, Sinai here at the, uh, these uh, south uh, mountains of the southern uh, uh, peninsula. This is the Sinai Peninsula. And this is where they have the monastery. And we were there on our tour. Um and as you look at the distance, so he he has multiple attacks he's making uh, about Sinai and Arabia. But the main thing he hones in on is this one right here, this verse. And he says, "This is it. Like th like this this proves Sinai's in Arabia. It has to be in um, the Sinai Peninsula." So Exodus three, this is the first verse in the Bible that talks about uh, the mountain of God, or Horeb. Um, it's when Moses takes. The sheep of Jethro. Remember, he's married now into the family and the priest of Midian. He's living in Midian, and even Doctor Falk agrees that Midian is northwest Arabia. For um, and some people try to make it other places, but no, at least he agrees on that point. Um, but then he says this verse proves that Moses had to go someplace else. You can't find uh, Sinai in the land of Midian. Um, well, it, he's reading into the text again. He's yeah. making um, this this part right here. This is the key phrase or word: West Side. Um, it basically says that Moses took the flocks. He went to the west side of the wilderness. Um, now he, Dr. Falk, when he uses this word, he reads into it, says, this is the wilderness of Midian. And he always says, wilderness of Midian. So it's west of Midian. So west of Midian is what? The Sinai Peninsula. And, and so on this, this was his key point he made about that is why he doesn't believe Sinai is in Arabia. Well, if you look at this verse, so some translations do say this backside um, 
let's just say it, uh, it is the West Side, like Moses wrote West Side. If you look at um, uh, da, 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 now, I don't have. <laughs> here we go. Let me go back. This one. okay here. Um, if you look at where the our proposed Mount Sinai is, Jebel Makla, the actual peak of Makla, uh, is Jebel Law is basically the mountain range. Um, this area here is light colored. That is where uh, the encampment is. That's a huge plain in front. That's our next point. We're going to actually saw in some of the slides. We're talking about the, the encampment in front of there. But if you think of Mount Sinai being the west side uh, of, 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 of a wilderness, well, what is east of Mount Sinai? It's the big Hizma Desert. This is where we, the red rock, like you see Wadi Rum in Jordan, or what we drove into on our last day of the tour um, before we climbed the mountain. So this is like over here is Tabuk, the province capital. Between here and, the, uh, and, and these coastal mountains, it's a huge, vast desert of beautiful sandstone and sandy, you know, red sand dunes, um, but very deserty. Uh, if you think of a desert, that's it. Um, and it said, Moses wrote that Mount Sinai was to be found on the west side of the wilderness. Um, and now this whole area, again, because if you read uh, Exodus chapter 19, the Israelites, when they're going through here, they're hitting different wildernesses. The wilderness of Shur, uh, the wilderness of Etham. Uh, they come into the wilderness of Sin, the wilderness of, of, of Sinai. When they camp in front of Mount Sinai, it was called the wilderness of Sinai. And then here in Exodus chapter 3, it just says Mount Sinai is on the west side of the wilderness. What wilderness? He doesn't say exactly what wilderness, but it does fit. If, if Moses knew this area, being with Jethro's sheep and traveling all through the area, he would have known that further out to the east was a huge, vast wilderness. Today, we call the Hizma Desert. Um, and so it can, and it can fit exactly what he wrote in chapter 3. You don't. The problem with those who say that this verse proves that Sinai is west of Midian, and it's over here. Um, and he's reading into the wilderness being wilderness of Midian. It doesn't say that in the Bible. It just says wilderness. It doesn't name it. Uh, but if it say he, he's what he's trying to do is you know put it over here, then you have Moses, which we know he's over here with Jethro somewhere, probably Albada, the traditional home of Jethro, the biggest oasis in the, that area. So he's living there. He he's having Moses take all those sheep all the way around on this long journey for no reason. Yeah, that's, that's ridiculous. I mean, that would sources. be how many hundreds of miles? That, oh, that's, oh, yeah. Yeah. I, yeah, I forget. But it's, And then you go into some nondescript mountain that has no water at it. It, it no just doesn't make any sense. Fish. In fact, so I, I don't know if you remember this in uh, uh, Patterns of Evidence. Uh, uh, Tim Mahoney confronts Roll on this point. Yeah. And Roll, Roll says, well, they had boats. He said, well, I've seen boats on the, on the, the, um, the Nile Delta. Come on, sheep. Let's and, time to get on the boat. We're going to, we're going to cross over. <laughs> Cause you have to, we have to go to Mount Sinai, St. Catherine, because there's nothing over here for us. No food over here. <laughs> and then the whole thing is, this is a very dangerous, it's straight to Tehran, which you know, like he's maybe saying they crossed with these boats with the sheep on it. First of all, there was no uh, ferry service for sheep back then, going from Midian <laughs> to the Sinai. Frequent flyer uh, miles they had. That was a special perk yeah, they had. Uh, how many sheep you have today, Moses? You got to pay for you know, one shuckle of sheep. Yeah. <laughs> you know? and, like, and then you have to come back that way too. Uh, so then Mahoney, I remember I, I took a screenshot because it was so funny. Because he was like, you believe what you're saying, David Roll? And I'm, he was just like, what? Do you think they took a boat to get from here to here? Because Roll realized that it was like impossible and – and illogical for Moses to travel with the sheep. Like Bedouins don't do that today. They go from here. Well, I wonder where Moses there. went with my sheep if I was Jethro. I mean, six months later, that would take like six months yeah. to get like over to the. Oh yeah, I mean, <laughs> it, 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 totally different area. It wasn't even the land of Midian. Sheep grazing like they stayed and... within their territory. Um, and then the other thing is, well, this, what did that mean when Moses took the sheep up into the mountains there? Well, guess what? And I, I read this, and I have to find the reference again, but. It was some explorer, like a British explorer who came through here. He was writing down what the Bedouins did. Uh, and he mentioned that they were, for based on the seasons, they'd go from the valley during the colder months and the winter. And then towards springtime, they start heading up in the mountains. And then by summer, they're, they're eating the vegetation up in the mountains. So it's cooler temperatures, uh, more, you know, it's cooler. So you have more veg vegetation still available by that time of the year. Um, and then it'd go back down. So the movement was not from here to here. It was um, elevation changes. It was it's from, just uh, literally from absurd to, to me. Like, it's just yeah. the fact so, that, like, <laughs> we even have to explain this, like, with a rational mind well, yeah, is mean, just honestly, like, and I'm to trying that. to be kind. Like, it's really the, the, it, but oh. I think the, 
the bottom line is though is that this the Sinai Peninsula, it, with according to the ancient maps, is Egypt, and and that's to me one of the. It's hard for me to imagine that the Egyptians. This is like the America of its time. This is an ancient powerhouse civilization, superpower. Yeah, that yeah. they don't control the Sinai Peninsula, and they're and yeah. the Israelites are now out of Egypt when they're like. What is that like? Fifty miles? Like I, that's just really well, hard for me to see the biblical narrative. Yeah, there's, two, there. there's two points you need to make, and it'll, it'll prove that this is the crossing. It has to be on the Gulf Lock, yeah. which only Nueva fits. And, and the one point that we kind of brief we mentioned it before, and that is the Israelites when they're at the crossing beach, they they say to Moses over and over, "You took us out of Egypt." In uh, Egyptian mind, uh, Egypt was the Nile Delta. The uh, uh, the Nile River, yeah, yeah. That, that small green area where all the gra- well, where they fed their their animals, they lived outside of that was like you know no man's land. And, uh, but outside of that, they had mines and quarries and <clears throat> forts and um, fortresses uh, all through the Sinai Peninsula, going up in the the, the uh, Mediterranean coast to Israel, you know, yeah. Gaza area. Um, and so this area, when they when they name the places here on their old, you know, we find them in the either in the Karnak temple walls, and when they when they carve these hieroglyphs and, and they name this, or in the papyrus that we find, uh, the, the names are given a, a foreign determinative, and, and that basically identifies. It's kind of like us saying today, if I if I I don't know, let's say Beijing for example, when I say like I went to Beijing. Uh, that doesn't sound like a, a name for a city in California or Britain, like you know, an English name. And it sounds Chinese. Yeah. Um, for them, they, when they name a the place outside, they, they, they have this this thing, this hieroglyph in front of the name, and that basically means, ah, oh, this is a foreign name. So they controlled, they had influence over the Sinai Peninsula. They had their mines and forts, uh, and they controlled the trade routes. Uh, but it was definitely so. There's um, proof uh, of exactly what we're just saying there. Then that 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 yeah, and, and they, I, they to me it's just obvious saying, when I look hey, at that. I'm I go, outside of Egypt. yeah, I go. That's the Egyptians. Yeah. Like I, I don't see. I just don't see that yeah. them traveling just to the Sinai Peninsula and thinking that they're oh, outside yeah. of Pharaoh's yeah. reach there. Like that. That doesn't seem to me to be safe. Like just just yeah, based and, on what I know, and I just have this, studied the Bible and you know my degrees yeah. and all that. Like I. It doesn't, you know, I, I just that, you. Yeah. for that, yeah, if it doesn't you look line at this up for map, me. If you look at this map, they're, they're going to nowhere. Um, there's basically hardly anyone inhabiting down there versus over here. You have the whole, yeah. uh, there's all these like Bronze Age uh, oasis cities and towns that are inhabited uh, during the time of the Exodus, the land of Midian and the other tribes around. That are not Egyptian. So it's, that's, yeah. The non-Egyptian, yes. and this is where Moses got his wife from. His two sons were born in this land. And nearby is where he took the flocks of Jethro doing that horizontal, uh, I mean, that vertical type of migration going from lower elevation to higher elevation to feed the flocks. It was nothing special. It was the normal thing they, they do still today um, versus what these guys are proposing, that Moses took this long journey or took a boat uh, to get to the traditional <laughs> Sinai. Um, so, uh, yeah, there's so much like to, to attack this site by using that verse. I think it basically shows that – they they never been out here and talked to the Bedouins or read these old historical accounts of how the Bedouins take care of their flocks. You, if you ask a Bedouin today in this area with their sheep, uh, why don't you go over to this area? To, like, why would you do that? Like, they would think you're crazy. Why would I take my sheep all the way around here? You probably lose <laughs> half of it by the time you get over there, and then by the time you get back, the rest are dead. <laughs> you know? Oh man! I mean, Jethro uh, probably sent the search just... party out for Moses. I'd imagine, you know, looking for him. <laughs> Look, remember, <laughs> it's like Jacob's brother. Yeah. You know, when they were migrating with sheep, yeah. they're going from watering hole to watering hole, <laughs> and then they go too far, and then like Joseph had to go find them. Yeah. Um, I want to let's see. I just want to quickly go through this rest here. Um, the, the other thing he talks about is uh, again he atta- he attacks the whole two million people. Like whether one or two million, you don't need that much of a, a campsite. So. You know, if you look at the acreage allowed, like the camping, it's kind of a weird design because I was trying to, um, not perfectly, but just go around <clears> where it was more flat versus, you know, some of the hills that we see out there. Um, so it's either between 11,000 acres, um, even if you do a more conservative one like this, and um, you don't count every single valley, but you don't count the hills, then you get down to almost uh, 6,000, you know, 6,400 acres. Nueva, the whole Nueva Beach, is uh, 6,500 acres. So even this, but say the more conservative one, is basically the same size as Nueva, which I believe is the Red Sea crossing. So uh, the Israelites could fit here. 
Uh, there's enough space for them. And this is high desert um, plateau area. So even the summer months, you have people in, in Tabuk in modern times. This is why we meet people out there uh, in the hot days. They come from the, the city of Tabuk. They drive the two and a half hours in, and they'll hang out here because it's cooler temperatures. Um, and you have fo- foliage out there, uh, bushes and grass. You have uh, the sheep and camels and whatever else uh, the cows could eat, uh, the, the stuff out there. So I think this is a perfect spot um, out of all the other mountains and proposed sites. Uh, this, to me, uh, matches perfectly. And we didn't even talk about – for example, the Bedouins who told Ron Wyatt back in 1985 or 84, when Ron was there twice, they approached Ron and said, Hina Jabal Musa in Arabic. That means here's the mountain of Moses. Now, this was before YouTube videos and before all Ron had a name about this being Sinai. So how would these Bedouins living here in this isolated area say this is the mountain of Moses? Where do they get that from? There's obviously a, a local knowledge that this was the spot versus St. Catherine's. And these Bedouins, you know, they don't have the PhD like the Egyptologists do, but they knew that this was the Mountain of Moses. <laughs> I'll prefer them over to PhD. I mean, I got a degree myself. I don't know if my vote counts. I got a doctoral degree in, you know, ministry, so <laughs> deem in. But, you know, like, I, well, I, to me, yeah, it's just yeah, obvious. Yeah, like, we're, you yeah. don't have to be a scientist <laughs> yeah. to, to – you could just be Captain Obvious and go, oh, natural land bridge. <laughs> oh, two mil- they need two million people yeah. to populate the promised land. Oh, you – Two million people can't fit at the traditional location, you know. Um, and then some of these other yeah, interesting here's things, that like aerial the split drone. rock, fascinating. And then uh, Sinai itself, oh, I think, which is what yeah. you're going to show us right now, right? Yeah, this is uh, – the Red <clears throat> Air points out the Jebel Makla Peak that you climbed up. You guys, I think, ran out of water or something. Yeah, we um, did, yeah. And then we here, actually ran out of water. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I remember when you guys I, I did it. Down. I so there was only there was four of us that ended up there that, from our group together. And you had to share, right? And I shared my water. I was the Christ like guy would. of the group, sharing my <laughs> yes. water. My son, he was like the first one to run out, so naturally I'm going to give him water. Oh. Yes, but then you had two others to take care of. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and then we're all drinking well, from the so, same. Yeah, what God brought fo- forth water from the pack. <laughs> Yeah. The, well, I remember my first trip, I made that mistake, the first couple trips. Now I overpack, and so yeah. I have like six liters, uh, a lot of water. But uh, the area, you can't really see from the camera. If you look close, it's just covered in these shrub um, brush, these bushes. Uh, sometimes you do see once in a while uh, acacia trees. A lot of them get cut down. Yeah, my legs were all cut up, my ankles and my oh, wrists. Yeah, the mountain itself has all this brush, yeah. and the thorny bushes too. Uh, but but even the plane I'm talking about where the Israelites encamp, the, the the animals get feed. So right okay. here, if you just look at the flat areas alone, you're almost at 6,000 acres. If you look at even some of the hills that are not too bad, you, you can get up to almost 10,000 acres for this whole area, if you want to be exact. So uh, for those you – know, there's no other mountain we have this type of plane going right up to the base of the mountain. Uh, so they you remember, they went to the base. They said they left their tents. They went – and stood at the base of Mount Sinai, and God gave the law. And then they run back because they were scared of what they saw. And they told Moses, you know, Exodus chapter 20, like, you, t- you, t- you speak to us. They tell Moses they don't want God to speak to them. And so there was a big enough area for them to do that. You have your, your tents um, around the mountain, and they could go up to the base, and enough space around that whole area where one or two million people could stand around and listen to the law being given. Um, this is more drone photos. You can see this is looking south. This is the new road, and again, it's 100% now. This is right here. There was an unpaved section when this photo was taken, but now it's all paved. Um, this is the eastern area. We drove out through there on our tour. Uh, closer view. It is so this beautiful. Is where we, we see the golden calf altar. That's right here. That's where the calf petroglyphs are. Uh, you don't see the altar of Moses down at the base. You see part of the stream bed coming out. Um, and then you see the huge plain just out there. And I love being out there. I can't wait to go back. It's an amazing area. Um, I don't know if you have time. He, Let's he makes, go through it, man. Um, yeah, at least I'd li- at least like people okay. to see pictures of like the like the high like the highlights, the gold the altar, yeah, the golden okay. calf, Mount so, Sinai, how it has a black yeah, and peak. I have peak, a couple photos you know? here. Let's. Uh, I, I, what I want to make a point here because he his attack against this was um, that these look like look, well a couple things. The cow petroglyphs. He says doesn't look like an altar. He basically he says this does not look like a Bronze Age altar. I think there's a he's. It looks like a bunch of rocks thrown on top of each other. It looks like a makeshift rock altar. Well, yeah. So here's my point. 
all, no one, you know, unless you're being very specific and say this is the altar. My point is, it's a natural platform to build an altar on. Like, yeah, there's a huge flat area. Yeah, another very elevated. interesting so, thing about the site that it has. It happens this to have cow altar. Yeah, um, yeah. You know, so I pointed them out right here. Here's oh, he doesn't really bring this out because um, he he mistakenly says everything in this area dates to the Nabataean. No, it doesn't. The Saudis in the book Al Bid they talk about, and I, I later I have a photograph of the book. <clears throat> But they mentioned that the dating of these um, – the carved petroglyphs, the ones that are carved into the rock, uh, they say it's up to the um, Iron Age. Uh, and they even say up to 1500 BC, which is not Iron Age but Bronze Age. But at any rate, they, it does date up through the time of the Exodus. So you can't say that these are, number one, Nabataean only. They're not. Or that, but other critics will say, well, these um, are made by Stone, you know, Stone Age people, Neolithic time, so much before the time of the Exodus. And no, it's not. The, even the – Saudi archaeologists in their official literature say that this dates up into the Iron Age, people carving cows on rocks. So we don't know who carved this one exactly. It doesn't say made by an Israelite, a drunk Israelite or whatever. You know, we just know that you know, <laughs> this is a, a, a rock here that could be used as a platform. It's at the base of this mountain. The locals say is the mountain of Moses. And it happened to have all these cows carved on it that dates to the right time period. So um, – Here's a close-up one. Now, here's something really interesting, and I'll briefly tell this story. Most people don't know this, but David Fazel was the one who actually found this with Ron Wyatt in 1985. He was a, a guy um, interested in looking for Noah's Ark. So March of 85, he, he flies for the first time to eastern Turkey, where I'm at, to see the site with Ron. So there's still snow on the boat formation. Oh, wow. Um, this Saudi, the, the, the Saudi uh, businessman comes along. And he heard about Ron's story about being captive the year before and in prison for almost you know two and a half three months, um, and so he the Ron you know invites him I think to Nashville and he and he meets the guy and then he says come to Turkey I'll show you what else I'm working on and so he's on the same trip that Fazl happened to be on too Fazl's first trip uh, when the guy was impressed and saw this the Noah's Ark site and all that he saw Fazl's um, dowsing um, uh, you know uh, metal uh, you know treasure hunting equipment. And so he invites Ron and Fazl to come legally, you know, he gives them business visas to Saudi Arabia. So in March, they go back to Saudi to the base of Sinai. They actually camp a couple nights at the base of Sinai, if I remember correctly. Well, Fazl's using his, um, his, his wands, and um, he's uncovering, like, some of these stone circles at the base uh, that, that had gold down in there. And so this Saudi really? man from Taboo, they had gold a in rich them. businessman, he tells his team to start digging because Fazl had uncovered – uh, these, these 18 foot diameter uh, double wall stone circles uh, and so he said hey this one have gold so they start digging he keeps looking for sites so he's at the base right near the guard shack he's way over there he starts uh, getting a large reading for um, gold across the valley so he keeps walking 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 until he gets almost to the this, this stone rocks and he, and he says in his newsletter that the Bedouins and the people he were with they're like no no we're not going any closer he said this area is cursed so that got his Are you serious? Mark. Wow. Both this, yeah. So here we have – and then that's when he discovers that there are um, cow petroglyphs all over the site. And he said there was a large gold reading, like whatever, wow. maybe during the party. Someone dropped all their jewelry, but there's gold in between the cracks down below. Um, uh, so at any rate, this is how the site's discovered. But what, what I thought was most interesting and most people don't know about is that how, how the Bedouins reacted that they thought this was a cursed site. Um and so here you have the, the story. Like we don't know. Did Aaron um, put the golden calf altar on top of this, or was it nearby? You know, or just as part of the whole party? You know, you had one or two yeah. people down below partying, and this is where the hardcore guys were at. On well, the, that's you know, that, that. So people understand because you can't really tell. Maybe you can tell from a picture because that might be a person on the bottom there. I'm not sure, but that's like the size no, of a small like, house. That rock pile, yeah, it's, and it's like huge. that that and, that calf, that drawing yeah. of a calf is like the size of a of a human being, of a an adult human being. Yeah, if you, if they laid on their yeah. side, I have a picture of my I son next to a, that uh, carving there. Yeah, here, here you can see Sinai from the you can see how the distance. So way over here is where Fazl started with his uh, his, uh, his wands, you know, the frequency generator they called it, and he got way <laughs> over here to this site because it had a gold. He's uh, a wizard. Reading. Um, He's the wizard. Yeah. Well, yeah, they, they, the Saudis thought. Well, cause so when he left Saudi Arabia, he said later they called him. They wanted to invite him back to go treasure hunting. They, they really liked what oh, the results God, of. I'll bet. Yeah. And, and, and Fazl said, no, he was done with, with Arabia. He wasn't going to go back anymore. Um, 
But at any rate, you can see the cows carved on the rocks right there. So it doesn't show the person size. Yeah. But, you know, yeah, you're up to here when you're standing. It's These are huge. They're not like small little things being carved. And again, the and location. Again, the say, and and this is, these are those big bullet no, no, points. Look, the, like the location yeah. of it, like you can see the, t- the peak of uh, Sinai. Go back. From there. Yeah, from the, the ball, from there, you can yeah. see the peak of Sinai. From the peak of Sinai, you can see that. Um, it's just right there at the base of the mountain. You got the water source there. You got what seems to be some kind of ancient graveyard. You got all like just all these things like, you know, yeah. uh, happen to be there. You know, to... Just happen to be there. Oh, just, yeah. All together in one spot. No, yeah. <laughs> if you found cow pet, there are cow pet in other parts of Saudi Arabia. Yeah. So if you find them, uh, you know, 500 miles away, oh, hey, we found cow pet but you don't find a Bedouin saying that's Mount Sinai. You don't yeah. find uh, an altar site. You don't have a big plain. You know, it doesn't match an Exodus route. Right. Well, the, <laughs> the other thing that so I would add about the carvings is I, I kind of look at the carvings the same way I look at the 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 chariot wheels. You know, it's like, yeah, I, I think it, it's with with history when you get to a certain point, it's it's really hard to date things. Period. So I mean, like. They, they could graffiti. absolutely have been, those could be on, have carved on there by the Israelites. But Mount Sinai, based on the scriptures, seems to be a place where they, the ancients knew the location of it. So clearly there were people, Elijah went back there at one point, Paul seemingly went back there because he makes a comment about going to Arabia, you know, in, in Galatians. Like, yeah. they seem to know where it was. According to ancient maps, and I, I don't know if you'll mention this or not, it was the largest mountain in, its, uh, in, the, in, in Midian. It says. I don't know yeah, if it's Josephus what, uh, that said that. Some there's some uh, ancient uh, historian. Philo, yeah, one of the. And, one of and those so that again that, yeah. points us to this specific location. And it, and even though that isn't technically Makla, I think it's Jebel Allah's would be the highest peak, which yeah. is like right next to it. But it's it's part of that it's group. Right next. Of, exactly. Yeah, of that that connected you know mountain range there. Yeah, and again, it's like a court case. You have. All these pieces adding up. Yeah. But when you go to some of these other proposed sites, and the most, like the the, the two biggest or famous ones are Har Kharkum in southern Israel, which is basically on the borders of the Promised Land. And I don't, you know, we could deal with that another time. But it's kind of a popular site people are promoting. But the biggest one that most people promote, of course, has been Saint Catherine. And so if you look at that site, none of the none of the pieces match. You might have okay, you have a little plane. So if you had five thousand people, okay, or ten thousand, they could camp there. But uh, if you look at other aspects of what was going on in that area during the late Bronze Age, there's nothing there. There's no oasis. There's no people living there. There's no land of Midian. Uh, so, uh, but if you look at this site, yeah, you, some things you're just not sure about, like the petroglyphs. You could say they were carved Neolithic. You could say carved up to the late Bronze Age. Yeah, like but, the but they are could saying. be. I mean, it's within reason to yeah, think exactly. that they could have been carved that's, that's by the, the Israelites. Like you, yeah, I don't it, think we it, could it, rule it out. That's all I'm saying. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And you can't rule it out. And so – but for those who want to, they'll just say, ah, no, it's not the Israelites. Well, why can't it be? You know, yeah. Especially when you're trying to date these things, you can't get exact when you're going to say, okay, this is 50 years before this time frame. No, rock art is very hard to date. Um, and, the, and the whole point that the Saudis and their own published literature about this site, they're saying that those uh, cow um, carvings – date up to the iron age and you know up to and then they say up to 1500 bc which is actually late bronze age um and that yeah, would be again, the, the time of the, the exodus would be the 1500 exodus. bc yeah, yeah so exactly yeah. it's 1446 um but even if you go past it into the iron age then it it'll fit too so um this another i want to go quickly on this one he attacks he says again this is actually a, a saudi attack the saudis published that they were saying this was a nabataean working workhouse workstation whatever you want to call it workshop um they say that during the time of the nabataeans which they made petra that was their capital uh so this is like the time of christ basically um that this kingdom uh out there in the desert they were quarrying the marble up on makla uh there's a quarry up there and they, they carved this uh these pillars now there's uh we've counted 10 i think there um, now, here's where he attacks those trying to say these are the 12 pillars. Uh, and he makes it sound like this is all Ron Wyatt stuff. Actually, Ron uh, did not believe that these were associated with Moses. Ron actually thought that Solomon, just like the pillars at the Red Sea crossing, he believed Solomon had a marble shrine at the base. His men or Solomon himself had built, um, and obviously his men, the king, to say, build this for me. But um, so Ron's theory, now, why did Ron think that? You know, well, and again, it's one of these things where we don't have the photographs. But Ron believed that he had saw in the 1980, uh, 
five when he was Earth Fazzled, he had saw um, one of these marble sections, and he said it was like that big, that had ancient Hebrew. And it said on it, he said it, it mentioned Solomon, and it said it dedicated to the mountain of God by Solomon. So it had Solomon's name and it had God's name. Wow. Um, and then he said he, because he was with the Saudis at that time and Fazzled, and he was afraid based on what happened the year before to him to show the Saudis something this important with the Hebrew. So he took, he said he picked up the rock and he, he, and, he, and he hurried up the side of the mountain there somewhere on that sloping side of the mountain. He buried it there as best he could. So and I, me and friends and other, you know, we, we looked all through there trying to turn over any marble rock to see if we could find something. But no, nothing so far. So that's Ron's story. I have no proof that it's true or that he interpreted it correctly. But if, if there is a, a shrine or if there's a rock that says dedicated to the mountain of God by Solomon here, that would settle the debate too. Uh, obviously, a description of that importance with Solomon stating this is Mount Sinai. Because there is no such thing, like we don't have a photograph showing that, um, you, you can't use that as proof. Uh, but again, Falk's attack is that, well, this is Nabataean uh, and not from the time of Moses, that when Moses set up the 12 pillars, there were standing stones, like you just push up one stone and set it up, and not uh, worked like columns that you piece together, like a Greek column. Um, so he's, I, I agree with him on that. Like, even Ron did not say these were from the time of Moses. I know it's popular. Uh, there are people today who's, who say like these are the remains of the 12 pillars. So you have 10 of them. Um, so uh, this is a difference of opinion. I'm not going uh, I, to – when I do my tours, I tell everyone the, the three theories. Number one, Moses <laughs> built this. Number two, Solomon built it. And number three, the Nabataeans were here doing quarrying. So those are the three theories about this. Uh, I don't think Falk can use this against Sinai. This is kind of like this – the, 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 kind of like the um, the stuff about the, the, the fused rocks on the beach of New Yeah, and it's, um, I would almost fit it into like the interesting circumstantial evidence. You know, I, like, yeah. I'm not going to say that it's Sinai because there. of those, but yeah, yeah. certainly it's not There's reason to say activity. it's not. We don't have 12. There's 10. <laughs> yeah, right. uh, you know, they're, they're marble. <clears throat> very important. Whatever was here was important. So anyways, that's – and here's some close-up photos. You can see it's not just you – know, people who have not been there, I'll show these photographs – because there's not just uh, these, uh, you know, um, column sections. You also have square blocks, and then thousands of chips. You know, so definitely a lot of pieces of marble. You can just pick up little tiny chips off the ground there. So they were working, like you know, shaping these blocks. And when you look closely, some of them actually have the tool marks on them. Um, you know, and now some of these they look very closely to the the tool marks on the columns and the blocks that I saw at Petra on my last trip there earlier this year. So. Uh, and I was going, I was trying to find it. It's it on my phone, but I didn't have time to add it to the slideshow. I wanted to compare, so you can see that these blocks that you do find at the base of Sinai, um, uh, the ch the chiseling mark does look really close to the uh, the, the chisel marks um, that you see in Petra, a Nabataean site. So it's possible that the Saudis are right and roll, uh, not roll, but um, <laughs> even roll. But uh, Dr. Folk is right that this is uh, Nabataean marble. It doesn't disprove this being Mount Sinai. This area is open to anyone to go through and come, come and go as they please. You know, over thousands of years, different people and groups been here. Midianites, I, I believe the Israelites were here uh, later. Yes, this was Nabataean territory. Uh, just south of Sinai is a Roman temple. Uh, so the Romans, they took over Nabataean territory and formed the province of Arabia during the time of Trajan. And so, yeah, you have different people and groups coming through up to modern Saudis. Uh, so I don't think you can um, use that against this being Sinai. Um, really quick. So then, uh, so these white, it's hard to see on the camera, but these white pieces, that's the marble. And you can now see this corral structure that uh, we believe that the animals came down and were sacrificed and went in. And it's very interesting. On my first trip here, we had even a local Bedouin, similar story to Ron. Now, this is during the age of YouTube, so you can say the Saudi <laughs> got the story from the internet. But the age at of any YouTube. rate, yeah, we met, yeah, cause we met this, this group of Saudi young men. They're in their 20s or 30s, and they showed us the site after we were sneaking around, you know, this whole week tour we were on. This uh, 10 of us on this expedition, the very first time in here. So, this was before it was legal to be in this area. Um, so, we were sneaking around. Well, the one, our final day of the trip before we climbed the mountain, uh, we found two baby goats. Uh, that were abandoned by their mother, and we took them to the gas station, and we met these this group of young men, Saudis. And again, they were there because they're from Tabuk. It was uh, end of April, first of May, so it was very hot already. But they were relaxing because it's cooler temperatures here in the mountains. And they saw the baby goats. We became friends. We we, we videoed uh, teaching the goats how to drink from a bottle. Uh, we got the milk and all that. 
Uh, but anyways, the guy said, hey, do you know – the one guy who spoke broken English, his father owned the gas station. And this man said – his name was Yosef, this man. He said, do you know that this is the mountain of Moses? So we played dumb. We don't want to say we were just there that morning like sneaking around. <laughs> so we're like, oh, really? Oh, wow. <laughs> now let me tell so you about it. <laughs> yeah. So well, him and his friends take us all the way to the altar, past the guard wow. shack, past the fence. And I'm filming the whole time. And this, I, the whole day I filmed all the clips. It's on my YouTube channel if you want to see it as it happened. Um, but when we get to the altar, Moses, here's what's really interesting. He actually tells the whole story. This is just a local guy. Um, so again, you might have got it from YouTube. Who knows? I don't know what was out on YouTube at the time. But he explained how the cows or sheep would come down this end, turn the corner, come over here, and then he said that you know be sacrificed, killed right here um, by Moses. So he had the whole animal corral theory down pat. It's like he knew. Uh, again, we don't know how he knew, but he – I videoed the guy explaining the whole thing to me. I was so amazed that here's a local Bedouin telling what happened, uh, what I believe to be the real Mount Sinai, 3,500 years ago where God tells Moses to set up an altar at the base of the mountain. And, and this is a corral. Now, Dr. Falk attacks it saying, well, there could be – this could be a corral, but many people come through here and there's nomads and maybe they built it. Uh, but it's just more uh, circumstantial uh, evidence. It's like you just pile it on top of everything else that you're seeing, and it's like, okay, I mean, it's yeah, definitely so, interesting. You know. And here's an, a local saying the same story um, more recent than when Ron was there, you know, with the Bedouins telling this is the Mount of Moses. Um, and so and then at the other thing I want to mention briefly, and so I'm, I'm almost finished, but uh, that uh, Dr. Falk doesn't mention this part. But the Saudis, when they excavated it, and, and their report's very limited. Their actually published book called Al Bid. Um, and, and it's not very detailed of what they did here, but they do mention that they found ash in one of the places right here of this area where the um, the guys, the Saudi told us that they killed the animals and what we were even theorizing that the, the corral was shaped like this and somewhere in this area would have been the altar right near at the end. And so the ash, again, we don't know what type of ash it was, whether it's you know from cows or something else, but they did find layers of ash when they excavated down at the end of that. So, um, you know, to me, you have all the, as you keep saying, you have circumstantial evidence, pieces of a puzzle that you can't just uh, deny it all and write it all off. It's, it's very interesting that you have this site there, and it's within distance for the sheep of Jethro to walk to, uh, and definitely not some long journey. Yeah, definitely. To the you don't have to make the scriptures do hula hoops to with this particular biblical site. I think that's the bottom line. You know, it, it things fit. The uh, narrative of and the maybe story that's why fits some there. people. Yeah, maybe that's why some people are not upset, but they're they're, they're like, wow, this is too good to be true. Um, you have the actual sites, and they're matching biblical parts of the story, the Exodus, uh, and they're so used to not having that, I guess. And you know, and I think scholars too, uh, <laughs> they 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 like to argue, like you mentioned, they like to just argue, um, yeah. just to be a, a counter you. Uh, so, well, you know, I've seen you know, sheep just, swim. I've seen them swim a long ways. I know. I know they could have. <laughs> <laughs> the, the boat. Well, the whole boat thing. Got <laughs> they didn't even need a boat. And the, the Mahoney's face when he said that, he was like, do you really believe what you're saying? <laughs> Roll. <laughs> they took a boat to Sinai. Yeah. I think you're mixing the stories up. And maybe he meant Noah's Ark. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're crossing the stories. That's the problem. It wasn't that Noah's was Ark. It. it was the Exodus. <laughs> But Andrew oh, could show you Noah's Ark. Yeah, I can show you all of that. Yeah. <laughs> then he'll laugh at that. Well, show I'm, if yeah. you're able. I don't know. Do you have pictures by chance of like the, the mountain peak? Because I feel like that's like a convincing, like Sinai itself, like Sinai proper. Yeah. To me, you know, when you when you think about uh, see. this, this gets into uh, the here. realm of, of like smoking gun category stuff. But like the fact that it's a blackened peak, the fact that you can actually walk, it's travelable. You can actually yeah. Well, climb up. up and down. On, like, yeah, you, like you have to have, at one point, there's like yeah. seven, the 70 elders, they're climbing up the mountain, uh, elders, not the 70 young people. They're climbing up the mountain with, with Moses, who's also <laughs> an elder. Elderly. Like, you can't, like, you can actually climb up this mountain. Yeah. It's not like yeah. uh, insurmountable. Well, I don't have not, a far away, I don't, um, the one I had close... Because his last point he does in his video, and this is the final um, – there's a couple slides. This is the final slide. But his last point is about the desert varnish on these stones and oxidation. Um, uh, he makes the point and, – and, and part of this I do agree with him on um, – that the black rock is basalt. Down below here is granite. This is not burnt granite. Not gra um, granite, but um, – yeah, granite. Um, down here is granite or – 
make sure I got that right. Yes, uh, granite rock is the base of the mountain. Basalt, which is a volcanic type of rock, is on top. But through the uh, mountain, you have veins of granite. You also have the quarry veins for the, the quarry, the marble veins that they quarried. So you have marble, uh, black basalt. I even seen green, blue rock. Look at this one. Uh, so this is on top of the mountain. Is white rock. We, we talked about the black rock on top. Here's the picture of that. Um, and then this. Uh, here's a couple other rocks. Here's a blue like coated one that I found on top of the mountain. And then here's another beautiful one that has this little thin layer. Um, a friend explained what the, how that's formed. It's very small, but like little flower petals across this rock. This is all on top. So it's not 100% black rock up there. Uh, majority is, but you do have these veins of uh, marble and granite going through. Now his point is that. But if you look uh, at it from the, the if you look at it from the base and you look up to the top, it looks black. Oh, you know, like the top of it looks like does, it has a black cap on it. Yeah. And that's why the name uh, – you talk to the locals. They actually give a name for the top uh, in, in Arabic. Um, the restaurant at the bottom is actually named after the top. And I, even, I asked them, what, why is this name? Said, oh, it's because of the black rock on top of the mountain, uh, this little restaurant beside the gas station. Uh, I said, well, that's a bad name for the restaurant because the, the, the name in Arabic means um, burnt or burning. <laughs> and I said, well, why would you want to call your restaurant burnt? <laughs> but I understand because you know, people see the black – you visually see it. It's, it looks black rock. And they say – some people say makla means – in uh, some form, it means um, burnt or burning. Okay. Uh, others say it means quarry because there's the quarry on the side there. Uh, but at any rate, you have the variations there plus the very top. Uh, again, I took a photo of the sign for the restaurant, and it's called like El uh, Morhai, Mahira or Mahara. Uh, I'm butcher, butchering it. Um, anyways, and, and I talked to the local. I said, what is that? And they said, well, it's because of the black rock. Now, scientifically, when you look at the rock, it's basalt, and when you, when you, uh, which is black normally. And when, and when you do open it, like, so people will tell you, well, when you open it up, it's darker inside. I have a well, couple of those in my living room right now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. This is one of my best samples. <laughs> and I don't have it anymore with me. But, you know, there's some really good ones up there when you, you find a vein. Like, not a vein, but um, like a break, a cleavage area, a breakage. Yeah. You break it. Yeah. You br- you're splitting the rock. Um, and when you break it open along those uh, cracks and crevices, you will you will see this darker the light. Uh, and you find it around the world. <laughs> I, I'm not going to um, – here's what I'm trying to get at, though. That the Black Peak, we don't know what the presence of God did to the rocks. Falk is saying, Dr. Falk is saying, well, uh, it's all desert varnish or oxidation, which is normal. If you have these rocks high in iron, it's exposed to the elements. So on the outside, you get a coating that turns darker. Uh, other times it turns light, and then the inside's dark, the opposite. But here, uh, it gets oxidized, like leaving metal out in the rain, it gets rusty. And so the outside is darker when you open it up. It's still basalt down here, but it's just a lighter color. Um, and so that's what he's trying to prove. And he's trying to attack the whole idea that, well, we have proof of the fire of God. Well, my only counterpoint I want to make to that is that, number one, I believe this is Sinai. So to me, these rocks are special because, yes, they were up there where God's presence was. What did God's presence physically do to the natural rocks? Was it like the burning bush where uh, Moses saw it and the bush didn't burn? It was on fire. But it didn't consume the bush. Was it the same thing for the rocks, uh, or did this oxidation process uh, get sped up, kind of like that the split rock? Did this natural erosion that would happen from God's fire? Years? Like, is that, is yeah, that what you're trying God's to say? Yeah, the God's presence oxida- Yeah, did yeah. it speed up? And that's what we don't. We know. don't know. And yeah, well, there's no way to prove it one way or the other. Really, I mean. Yeah, I, I, I talked to a PhD who who used to run the, the lab, the, the state lab in. Um, for mines and minerals in South Dakota or North Dakota. He, I brought him out there. He was interested in the site. And he was going to do a whole study on these rocks. And he said, well, it's very difficult because how do you prove divine fire? You know, we don't have like, here's an example of divine fire. So let's make sure it matches. You know, you don't have them. <laughs> so you try to prove something. It, it's a very interesting uh, test. And so we had something we were going to do. It never ended up being done. But the whole idea that maybe the oxidation is different up there or more oxidized, like something that would take 5,000 years or 4,000 years to oxidize, Maybe it, it, it took that, you know, 11 months with God's fire up there. And so you have uh, – and so we wanted to compare this to nearby basalt rocks, to basalt rocks further away. Uh, a very expensive study they said that we were to do that. Uh, but it's not melted. You, know, you see the rock. You know, melted rock is a glassy like obsidian. It, there's no uh, flow that you don't see like the rocks like you melted like a lava flow. Um, uh, so – but to me, they're special. I, every time I go up there, I, cl- I take a couple. Um, everyone wants a piece. 
uh, the Rock Society. <laughs> uh, but in general, when you look at the, the geography, the history, the local tradition, we um, we didn't even uh, turn it off. Oh, uh, one second. So, yeah. Well, that was the end, guys. <laughs> I know that's a TV. It's time to wrap up. I, yeah. up. I, don't know why it's I thought we gave a pretty good holistic view, though, of the of the uh, yeah, the location and why. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know. Sorry, I, guys, I, I think but... you gave a, a very good overview of of the ma- of the main points, which I think is is really what you need. You know, when you're yeah, looking at this, I wanted to cover um, the oasis. Uh, he didn't bring it up because, you know, these are the – he didn't talk about the points that are really strong points. And it's about the archaeology of Midian, that people were living there where Jethro lived during this time of the Exodus. Yeah. And you have today, going even going back 3, 000, no, 300 years or so, up to 1700s, I think, you have uh, people talking about the locals in that area mentioning Moses uh, striking the split – you know, stri- striking the rock. And this was that Magna, the, the oasis that had the, the 12 bubbling springs. Um, yeah, I remember so they, that. Yeah, yeah. So that oasis, there was a story in 1700s, an Ottoman. So this is the Turkish Empire. An Ottoman geographer came through the area, and he wrote down that he talked to the Bedouins. And one Bedouin said, "Well, let us show you the rock that Moses struck. That water came out." And so they showed him a rock near there. So it wasn't the giant split rock, but it was, it was very close. You know, Magna is very close. And this is again northwest Saudi Arabia. This is not the Sinai Peninsula. And so the the rock that Moses struck there was only one time he did that. And the water came out. That happened um, early on in the Exodus. That was the, at Rephidim, the camping site right before Mount Sinai. And Kadesh, when they're at the Promised Land borders, he strikes the rock when he's supposed to speak to it. That's a different site, different event. But at Rephidim, Moses struck, struck the rock. And here's a local Bedouin 300 years ago, before Ron Wyatt, <laughs> telling this Ottoman traveler, explorer, you know, map maker, explorer, that, hey, I'll, I'm going to show you the split rock of Horeb. <laughs> and so, Again, in the, northwest the, Saudi Arabia, not in yeah. the Sinai Peninsula. And so, how does this guy like they have yeah. a whole separate? This is three hundred years ago. Yeah, and this is separate tradition from Saint Catherine. You know, Saint Catherine, the monks there, they have their own. Uh, they'll show you an area where they say that Moses struck the rock. Uh, it's not a giant split rock, but there's an a and they site. have the burning bush there too. Yeah, they so, have, right <laughs> Moses the, well. They got it all. It's like a tourist site. You know, oh you yeah, and it. it's right within nearby the gift shop. You know? <laughs> it's all within five feet of each other. Yeah, it's very that's convenient. You know, yeah, I wonder, I wonder where all the Israelites lived. Don't forget the gift shop. You, know, you have the yeah. gift shop. You can buy all that. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I think the guy um, Ron actually he was with us on our tour. Had a um, oh, yeah, he bought Ron. it was like an ancient copy of he the uh, Sinai the Codex like uh, Sin, <laughs> Sinatic, Sinatica. Sin- uh, yes, <laughs> one, yep, one of those. He bought it. It was like yeah. one hundred and two hundred. It was the books. Codex that was discovered. It was a copy of the Codex that was discovered at the monastery there. But but that the history of the of Saint Catherine's as Sinai that goes back to Constantine's mother. Yeah, and they say, you know, yeah, so, St. Helena. They so that, say that – you're talking – what is – that's uh, 1,800 years after the Exodus? Yeah. That's like, like, that's like two that, – yeah. we're closer to Constantine's mom than she was to the Exodus. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it, it – <laughs> Yeah, I know. If you look at it, you then you wonder – like, why can't these scholars with PhDs figure it out, too? Yeah. Um, well, Constantine's think, mom said this is Sinai. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but they're not willing to let uh, Ron Wyatt or some other explore without a degree. Yeah. <laughs> but they, but you're, you're going to listen to someone's mother from the Middle Ages before they had all this knowledge. I was like, oh, man. Yeah, that's, it blows my mind. It's just and, and the exodus. You know, if you look at all the, these sites and um, – and that, that we're that I'm studying, especially like the Exodus route, <clears throat> where Mount Sinai is located. Uh, to me, like this is the most logical uh, site that makes the most sense out of anything I'm like interested in. Um, I like, agree like, with you 100, percent man. Yeah, I just I'm like, I can't wow, see it any other way. People... I mean, just from a logical, rational like perspective, I I really can't. You know, and then you look at the biblical, you compare the scriptures. Like you start talking about like what's possible. The sheep, you know, he's not going to graze the sheep. You know, 400 miles away. You right. know. I'll see you in three years, Jethro. Like it's just this stuff. It doesn't make it makes no sense. You know, but people. It doesn't make today, any sense. But uh, the Bedouins with the flocks of sheep, they they've been doing that for that same tradition, that same migration, everything for thousands of years. And what yeah. that one guy wrote about them going up into the mountains during the heat towards the summertime and coming back down in the winter, exactly what Moses did. There was no tradition of people yeah. taking their sheep from 
Northwest Arabia to the southern Sinai Peninsula up into these mountains. And there's definitely no tradition of a boat service for sheep. So sorry. Yeah, and I think <laughs> and they didn't swim either. Yes. But I think like from a scriptural perspective, when we like we started with this idea of like why is this important? Yeah. It's it's important because like when I see this, this is just me personally, and I know you feel the same. It encourages your faith. Like I look at oh, this and yeah. I go, I can actually see the Bible happening in these locations where you can't, with the other ones, you got to fudge it. You got to force it. You got to come up with some different, you know, smaller number. You got to have like, you know, the crossing site up in some weird place. That's actually technically still in Egypt where, you know, it was like, you know, there was, you know, they they crossed over a puddle or a river and they're, they're dumbing down the Bible stories. And it just really sort of like, it takes all the magic out of everything. And, and I'm not saying that, that this is the site because it puts the magic back in. I'm saying it's the site because it's the most logical place. But yeah, exactly. one of the adverse effects of that is that makes you go, wow, this was like, this was bigger than I thought. You know, this, no. this is, God is amazing. This was, these were Amen. huge miracles yeah. that were the foundation of a whole people group and not just the foundation of that people group, but through Christ, these are the found, this is the foundational narrative of of the civilization of the world, of all those who are grafted in to Israel through Christ, through faith in Christ. So this is, this is just super important stuff, super helpful. Brother, I know you're like, I think it's like 12 o'clock, 1230 there. Yeah, you got to be going on 1 a.m. So I want, I want <laughs> to let you, uh, I want to kind of let you go and, and the TV knew. Uh, appreciate so much. Sleep. So even my television went to sleep. So <laughs> <laughs> Appreciate this so much, and I, yeah. I just I believe this is going to be a blessing for people. And I just want to encourage people again: go to uh, it's Discovered Media on YouTube. Yeah, DiscoveredSinai.com is the website, and then DiscoveredSinai.com uh, is Come the website. If somebody wants to book a tour with you, yeah. a church group, whatever, I can't encourage you enough to do it. I did it uh, several years ago. In fact, right right next to me on the wall, I can't pan the camera over there, but um, you could see all these these pictures from our. Let me see if I if the one angle. I don't know if people can see this or not. I have to Let me see change my you do um, have yeah, i see stuff hanging on the wall there but you, those are the pictures from the trip those are the pictures from the trip yep you know, let me see I, if it all there we go okay right right here uh, you can't really see them you can't make them out but right there and actually right up here is actually the it's a picture of me baptizing my son in the jordan river but these are all basically this this picture right here is that petroglyph of the calf and my son is standing next to it there's a split rock there's nueva there's the pyramids there's elijah's cave there's the beautiful picture right here of the golden calf altar my son's on top of it and you can see the burnt peak of sinai on in the background i'll call I'll, i'm just gonna say it's burnt <laughs> in the it's burnt by something whatever it was something it's it's, it's a volcanic rock but it's you can see that up in the i mean so you can just see the bible uh come to life here i mean just you know absolutely amazing man We were giving these yeah. uh, these uh, you know mini uh, uh, sermonettes there and such. I mean, this made the Bible come alive. And more than that, uh, you know, as was it First Corinthians ten, it talks about that these were written down for our examples, yeah. so that we won't do the same thing that they did. You know, we're like, well, why would they complain? In fact, in our trip, I, I don't want to mention names, but there were people who were complaining about the food. And, and I told people, you sign up for this trip, we treat you just like the Israelites, you get manna and water. <laughs> <laughs> no, but um, I, I just remember that there, like, that this, some, one person was complaining openly about the lunch, the picnic lunches. Uh, but I kept, and I kept thinking. I thought, know. I thought you did an A plus job, man. I mean, I, I felt like, I mean, you, we had like spreads, like Middle Eastern spreads everywhere we went. I mean, that one where we did the camel ride out on, I think that, that was, was at Nueva. That we went up great. into Wadi yeah. Watir, which is where we think the Israelites and then the yep. Egyptians followed them down to Nueva. And, and, uh, I was just watching, yeah, I was just watching. We were in the middle video. of nowhere, and we're doing a camel ride, and then all of a sudden there's like all these, or, or I think it was right before the camel ride, and we went and got on the, cam- on the camels from there. But there was all, all this this spread, like these yeah. locals, they're cooking in a little fire pit at the campfire. Yeah, I mean, that, giving us it, coffee, uh, I, like I, Hudra Oasis, that uh, is this right near Nueva, but yeah, into the mountains. That was our day. We went to Wadi Watir. And then right after that, we did the camel rides. We did a Jeep ride. We got into the Wadi Watir so people could see what they're like to be lost in the wilderness. And then we got <laughs> we had lunch at this oasis that I know one scholar who has a PhD who says this was Jethro's home of all places. They're trying to put Midian in Sinai Peninsula. I was like, oh, man. Okay. Yeah. Anyways, but that was the same oasis we had, Ayn Hudra's, where we had our little dinner there with the Bedouin cooking. Um, and then we went on the camel ride. And I, I still <laughs> – I mean, I shouldn't mention this, but I still have the video that um, 
that uh, Dwayne made of me trying to get on that camel. They gave me this little tiny camel, <laughs> and I and my my gut, and and I'm just and it, it sounds like this. And it took me forever to get on that thing, and I didn't know he was secretly recording the whole time my struggle. <laughs> Well, that was where that was where when we were eating lunch that day, when my ear popped back for the first time. Oh, finally, you. I don't know if you remember when we met. My so I had this like little issue with my ear, and it didn't pop back when I landed because it was the first time I flew in forever. Well, that's gotta hurt. And yeah. so I, I started doing this, you know, where you blow and you try to yep. pop your ears or yawn. Or, yeah. And I actually blew so hard that I blew all the blood vessels that's out right. of my eyes. Your eyes were. It looked all... like I was in like the the Logan Paul. Um, yeah, or Jake Paul, Mike Tyson fight. Like, my, literally looked like I had two black eyes because no, from it doing like a so hard. And that was the first I met you. I sh- came and shook your hand. I think the yeah, next like, day. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Who are you? <laughs> looked like I just came from a demonic seance or something. But yeah, that yeah, that was the first I, no, time that a, I had heard out so... of that ear in for like several days. I forgot you. And then we had a couple. I others. think because we were at an elevated height, so yeah. I think it actually popped a little. Yeah, exactly. And then like. So we had a number of people who were sick. Um, of course, you get, when you go to eat, I hate to say it, uh, you got to be very careful what you eat. Uh, so we had a couple people who were really sick at Nueva. Yeah, uh, I never had any issues. Me and my son never I, had any yeah, issues. I didn't with have any. But I know anything. by the time we got to uh, 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 Mount Sinai and the whole Saudi part, uh, we, and then we brought in new people on that. I think more joined us. We had um, – Almost uh, thirty people, I believe. On, yeah, on we the, had um, Keith Johnson from A Rude Awakening. Yeah. He fills yeah. in for Michael Rude. Here's the last minute uh, add on. Quite a bit. I don't know if he still does or not, but he was on the on that second half of the trip yeah. with the second part of the trip. Yeah, we, it more, which I think that was the, the like Saudi the third trip. leg. It yeah, was the, it is. Because everybody, that, I was with people that started off. I, I jumped in on the second leg in Egypt, yeah. and there was people that were there from Noah's Ark that had been traveling. We had uh, six or seven of us from Noah's Ark. Uh, and then uh, Egypt, we, we um, got a couple more people. Ron joined, you and your son joined, and then Dwayne joined. And then Dwayne, he already saw Sinai. He went back home. He went to Turkey and then just Egypt only. Uh, and then on Saudi, which is the most popular tour we give is the Saudi one because, you know, it's more uh, just open, you, you kind of say, and uh, not a lot of people have been there. Uh, so it's really popular. So we had a lot more people join that. And then a few of those stayed on. We did Jordan and Israel, I think, in uh, we went back to like six or seven people, and I think we, yeah, we tried. We met you in Israel again, uh, just uh, yeah, in yeah, we o- have, yep, Oha. yeah, we got smoothies, and, uh, and you gave us sulfur balls <laughs> from Solomon Gomorrah. That's, right. That's true. I don't, did you guys get them out of the country? Or did they I found a finger away? bone. I'm just kidding. <laughs> One of the sulfur balls. I was going to say. <laughs> An ancient finger. Oh, did, you, did you take them out? Did you actually get them? Home? Oh, I got I got them in my living room right now. Yeah. Oh, good. Because sometimes I, they get I, I sh- Oh no, no, no! I I have them right here. Hold on one sec. <laughs> yeah, they were literally right behind the camera. I forgot about that. So here's you put them that's, in cases. I smuggled oh, that's all this awesome. out. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're gonna smell up your room. If you open it up. Yeah, I don't open it. Yeah, but there's a. You can see there's a big one there. But you, they, you, you know, wow. that's another place you take people to the Sodom and Gomorrah site. But these are, yeah. we do. Those are rocks. Sides. These are these are rocks from the Saudi side of uh, of this uh, of this Red Sea crossing oh, site. So I'm top. not raising it high enough. That's a. Uh, what's that's the sand. That's, that's the, the sand from that? the Saudi side. It's bigger stones, but. We were at that no, resort on the, the Egyptian it? side that had the finer sand, but I, I felt like these were more authentic. So that's what I no, the other, no, the other, uh, no, that's the the palm, the dome palm nut. The other, this, this one. that's yes. from uh, that's from Elam. Uh, wa- yeah, that's from Elam. I don't, I don't know. My can I got the like yeah. hyper blur on my camera. Maybe I should even pull no, these back because no, I, I got yeah. the hyper blur. So I should probably put them right. You know, you know that so was the oasis. Forward. I told, you know, I told everyone about looking for those because they're hard to find, <laughs> like laying on the ground. Um, no, the, uh, the, 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 the dome palm nut. Oh so yeah. I told yeah. everyone to look. Yeah. I totally took so one of those. I, 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 so I <laughs> know uh, it's okay. So I had, um, actually had immigration look it over and they brought the agriculture department in Chicago. They said, oh yeah, you can bring these into America. Oh, there's the rock. Uh, yeah. The there's a, that's fr- And you can see the little veins that you're talking about here where, yeah, you know, the, the, the <laughs> more brown colored, but then it's definitely like a blackish wow. kind of. Yeah, darker yeah. on the outside. So Jake um, took the big. I took some small ones, a bunch of small ones. You and Jake, <laughs> he filled up his pack with like these massive. So he See, climbed like always... whatever it is a two or three hour climb down. Like he had like 
10 of these massive break. rocks. <laughs> and he just yeah, wanted to give like one that. to um, – Somebody, I can't even remember. He wanted to give it to somebody so bad when he got down there, uh, oh, wow. one of the rocks. Somebody that couldn't climb oh. it, and I can't remember oh, who it was. Okay. But oh, the tour. Yeah, yeah. Was it Sarah? Yeah, might have might have been um, might have been um, Ewan from. Uh, yeah, if oh, any of these people are like... listening to this video today, we love you, man. It's been it was a great trip. Yeah, from New Zealand. <laughs> he lives in New YouTube. Zealand. Yeah, yeah. There's you. Yeah, you know what? Yeah, him and um, <laughs> the um, Matt and uh, his wife. They went to see him in the New Zealand. Did they? Yeah, they went. They had Get a tour out. down okay. there together, and then Matt went back. So he's like always he's traveling. Like Mateo and his wife are traveling. Yes, they're, they're amazing. Every, I see pictures. I'm friends with them on Instagram. They're they're in a different. Same with them. Um, I don't think they have a uh, home. They just travel around the world. <laughs> all, like, well, they retire. They could do that. Yeah. So the other <laughs> uh, the other couple. Um, oh man, Jeff and Audrey, Audra. They travel all over. They were just here nearby in um, Armenia. Uh, and, uh, I saw they and came so, back to Sinai to go up, and they went up uh, a little bit further. Yeah, I, I think <laughs> I met them. They, uh, yeah, they didn't get as far <laughs> as they wanted to go, so they want to come with me on a future trip uh, down the road. So, but yeah, maybe I saw some of those people that. leave comments in the uh, comment section. Well, hey, brother, I'm gonna let you get some yeah. sleep, man. And uh, it was hey, it was a lot of fun. Make sure if you're watching this, uh, yeah. look into this because it's just a great. I think just it's a great study. It's a great, great fun hobby to look into, you know, the possible location of Mount Sinai. I think if you're somebody who wants or needs evidence for your faith, you got it right here. And if you want to see it in person, uh, reach out to Andrew because it's, it's just a great time. So, Andrew, thanks again, man. I really appreciate everything. Yeah. And I think there's a lot of a lot of good information in this uh, this segment we did here today. And God bless you, my friend. I guess maybe I'll see you, you in the minute. future in Thank Turkey, you. Lord willing. Yes. Come over here. We'll yeah. Serve your kebabs. <laughs> yep. <laughs> God, God bless you all. Uh, you yeah. know the usual like, share, subscribe, and we'll see you in the next video.